I would like to bring the March 20th Planning Board meeting to order. I will note uh, that there are some copies of our agenda on the back table in case anybody would like to view them. Um, the minutes of our previous meeting, February 20th, have been presented. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the meeting be accepted as presented. Is there any second? Second. And second, that, uh, are there any questions? Or? Take a vote that they be accepted. All those in favor, show by the raising the right hand. Any opposed? <clears throat> we have received correspondence. It is uh, part of the record, and on our table tonight, uh, we have received some other correspondence that, is, uh, that I will state here for the record. Um, a letter from Paul Vos with a response from Bruce Smith on March 16th. A letter from Indrit Resso on March 15th. A letter from Diane Eldridge on March 15th, an email letter from Hal Wire, and a letter from Rosemary Reed on March 19th. The old business tonight is a request by Herbs and Doris Strout a site plan review to construct a new 180-foot telecommunication tower located at 14 Strout Road. Would you uh, come to the podium and uh, discuss this project, please? State your name and... My name is uh, Justin Strout, and I'm third generation <coughs> of Strout here. <laughs> And I guess, um, trying to figure out exactly what you want. You want an overview, and then you can open it to the public, or? Just uh, summarize your project and bring us up to date yeah. at this point. We're looking to put in a 180-foot guide tower, which uh, appears here, whereas there's an existing self-supporting tower. Um, we're trying to use the lot to the best of its ability so we can buffer the new tower with the old tower. Um, it would be as close as practical. And we're trying to minimize, you know, tree cut down and, and anything like that. Um, the towers are the same height, but the difference is the guide tower has a 48 inch cross section constant all the way up it. And the self supporting tower, um, it's about 19 feet at the base and it goes, tapers down to about 57 inches. So this tower would be substantially narrower and um, than the existing tower. Um, so we'd hope that it would, you know, minimize impact for the, from the view by buffering it behind it. Um, the tower that's there now is up to basically 100% of its capacity. So engineering has says 99.8%, and we're looking to expand. We already um, have some customers in mind for the tower, and we're looking to do that. Um, looking for a 20 by 30 foot building at the base of the tower, or at least permission to do that, and then possibly a smaller building, depending on what we, you know, what we do with customers. Um, the existing self-supporter was built in 1989, and it's taken about 12 years to fill. Um, and we're hoping this tower can hold that much and more. So we're hoping it'll be another 10 to 12 years before we have to come back for any other additions. Uh, the tower is sited, as we said, at 14 Strout Road, essentially, and um, it's on a 30-acre parcel, and that parcel, and I believe, it says April 15th of 2000, the town rezoned it and made it a tower into the tower overlay. Um, it's a really good location for towers. Um, like I said, there's existing towers there, and basically we see no need to expand out anywhere else in the town if you already have some towers there, and especially if we can buffer it 
with the um, existing tower. I think it would be a good location. Um, are there any other questions? Well, thank you. Um, at this point, I will open it up for a, a public hearing. Um, and if there's anybody in the audience that has anything to say that would like to discuss the subject, uh, please step to the podium and introduce yourself. At this point, uh, hearing nobody willing to or interested in stepping up, I will call the uh, public hearing closed and uh, proceed at this point to uh, <coughs> present it to the board to uh, discuss this issue. I have a question on the abandonment requirement. It says the applicant has agreed to remove the tower within 12 months of cessation of operations. Do we have anything any more specific than that? Do you want to add anything to that? I, I, did you say anything in your package or your submission about what you will do if you, I believe there was a statement that says that when they cease to use it for a year, they'll take it down. But that was the only thing in the package. It, it's my understanding that is one of the conditions. Right, but cease to use it meaning not one antenna being used on the, on the tower? Or what yeah, I mean, if it had 12 antennas and we were down to one, we'd certainly want to continue to use it. Yeah. But when it's no longer useful, it, would be, it wouldn't be to our benefit to leave it there. It's relatively inexpensive to take it down. There was one other thing that last meeting I said my, my drawing for the building was 20 by 30. And at the end of the meeting, uh, you asked me what size it was, and I believe that I said that it was 12 by 20. I want to be sure that it still is the 20 by 30. It, it was my understanding that we were approved for a 20 by 30 building. If we chose to have a smaller building, that permit would allow us to do a smaller building. Just for the record, would you state your name? and? Okay. <laughs> so, so the, my, my name is Paul Strout. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it, it does, it, except for the fact that if, if, if technology somehow improves where antennas can carry more, we may end up with a situation of two antennas, neither one of which are being fully used, and I don't know how that is treated by our ordinance if at all. Uh, if, if we step back from the tower for a moment and just look at site plan review, which this tower is subject to, um, typically once you get approval for site plan review and you activate it by actually doing the project, um, it's, it's permanently in place. It doesn't <coughs> expire. Okay. So, so long as there's one antenna on the tower, it can still be used. I have one other question, if I may. Sure. In one of our previous sessions, we talked about uh, specifying that the color of the cable would be gray mm -hmm. to match the tower itself. Do you have any objection to also specifying that antennas and alternative tower structures also meet that color standard? Well, I wouldn't. Uh, the only thing that I would question is electronically whether you could put that paint on the ray domes of the towers and still have them perform the way they would, and I, I can't answer that question. Myself, I wouldn't have a problem with it if it's technically feasible to do that. They typically come either white or 
I mean, I've never seen them a fluorescent color or anything like that. So they, they're sort of unobtrusive anyway. But if it's possible, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Like Chairman, uh, be before we review the motion, I'd like to offer a change to the, the draft motion that we have in front of us. All I'm right. not sure what the proper protocol is for that. I didn't mean to. That's okay. That's fine. Jeff, I can't hear you. You can't hear him. Would you like me to just, just state, uh, state the motion with my like proposed to change? Add it to it, and we will uh, incorporate it. Okay. And, uh, Item two of the, the motion itself currently states that the cabling of the tower be a gray color to match the tower structure. I would propose we modify that to read that the cabling and all installed tower structures and antennas of the tower be a gray color to match the tower structure. Issue me. I'm an old man scout. And um, on the coloring of the antenna itself, I'm uh, worried about saying gray because they don't all come that way. Most of them are aluminum colored which is off, sort of off gray. And as the weather gets at them, they turn gray. I would hope that you wouldn't specify particularly the color on the antennas because they manufacture them one way. And we, if you paint them, you upset the uh, tuning and everything that goes with them. Uh, as far as the cable, well, we can do that. But the antennas, I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, well, my my job outside of the planning board is to manufacture microwave communications antennas and 90 percent of the antennas we sell are painted gray well if that's so the case I, I felt comfortable that that was a reasonable request to put into this motion okay sorry with me if you know that's a fact but he's talking microwave it's not necessary. Uh, are you speaking of microwave dishes or or the other types the antennas for microwave communication uses are those are gray anyway, aren't they? After they're painted, they are, yes, sir. Yeah, but you take the ones with the, um, well, like dipoles or the panel things, they generally are white. And uh, if you paint them, it's going to mess up that high frequency uh, propagation to some degree, I suspect. Maybe not, but it would be, it would put quite a burden on us to, to, to say gray on antennas themselves. The ones which are up on the present tower, um, I, have you heard any objection to the color of those? They're white. That's what they'll be like, like the ones that are on the present tower. Uh, part of my thinking in suggesting the, the gray color is I do think the antennas that are on the existing tower stand out more than the tower structure itself. Well, you, yes, you'll notice them. They, they have a whiteness, and if the sun hits them, you'll see them as a white right. color. And um, if you say gray, I've never, uh, well, I can't say I've never seen one, but I've seen very few that aren't white when the radons are put over them. And uh, that's why I worry about just being too specific on the gray. It would hamper the, a lot of uh, present-day practices, I think. 
Sir, you have a lot more experience in this part of the industry than I do, so I think I will modify my proposed change to the, to the motion to eliminate reference to antennas and only refer to cabling and installed tower structures. Do you think that would be reasonable? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, we had a previous vendor uh, come and apply for site plan review, putting some antennas on the existing tower, who brought us in a gray fiberglass uh, antenna cover and showed us photographs of antennas and said that they were gray and the ones that are on the tower now are white. Uh, so I think some language that would uh, emphasize uh, that if possible they provide gray. I, I think given the, the case in the past every time I drive by and you can see it white against the gray clouds and there was an applicant who came in and said it would be gray uh, I, think in a, I think an effort would be nice. Yeah. We all agree with that. I mean, if you can put in the proper wording that if it's technically possible to do this, we'd gladly do it because it's nothing to paint an antenna before you put it on the tower. But you can see what Dad's point is. He would hate to have, hate to lose a customer because they couldn't paint their antennas. Mm -hmm. But if right. you look out for our benefit by saying that if it's technically possible or however you feel that you need to wear it. We don't have a problem with that. Okay. Maureen? Um, what I was going to suggest in an effort to meet the board's concerns about the color and still meet the concerns of the applicant regarding some flexibility, it sounds like for the most part you're expecting to be able to meet the technical requirements of your equipment in a gray color, and I consider aluminum a gray color. Uh, perhaps what you can do is leave the, leave, leave the amendment as proposed, and only if you cannot meet your technical requirements, you can come back to the board for an amendment. You, you've got to try really hard to use gray. <laughs> what concerns me is, okay, let's say for instance, we have a customer that comes in there and say, this is stupid. You can't paint the antenna because, and we can't make it gray. What is our time frame to come to you people and ask for a white antenna instead of a gray antenna? If the planning board places an amendment, a condition on your approval that says all the equipment has to be gray, yeah. and you don't want to put a piece of gray equipment on there, I would consider that an amendment to the site plan approval, and we could bring it back to the board as a de minimis change on the next planning board agenda and they would have the opportunity to either approve it or ask you to continue with the condition. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Schroen. I guess, I, I don't know if I'd be willing to go that far. I mean, we, the whole point of this is we are allowing a tower to hold antennas and obviously um, We've tried to limit the areas where the towers and the antennas can be, but uh, we can't say that the antennas can't be used at all. And I think in limiting the color and in making them come back for an amendment because of the different color defeats the purpose of allowing the tower in the first place. I think I would be comfortable in just saying that uh, the antenna should be gray if technically feasible and then if the code enforcement officer sees a white antenna and wants to inquire as to why and why it couldn't be gray then maybe we can go from there but to make them come back every time there's an antenna that isn't gray I think places too much of a burden on what obviously is uh, supposed to allow antennas on the tower since that's the whole point of it and uh, I, I guess I wouldn't be willing to go that far to make them come back and seek an amendment each time um, when otherwise I believe they can put antennas on without coming back to us. Mr. Charles, how do you feel? As a <laughs> in your My technical understanding is that you can make an antenna any color you like it. 
if a coat of paint would be uh, deleterious to the performance, then you could mold the plastic gray dome out of gray plastic instead of white. I think it's mostly industry practice that they're all made white because that's easy and cheap and consistent. So I'd be reluctant to in impose a standard in Cape Elizabeth, which is so different from the industry that we put the Strouts and their their uh, tower customers, you know, in a disadvantageous position. But I do think we need to find a way in the wording to specify our desire and intent that all, everything is gray unless there's a good reason why it isn't. Now, how do we put those words into place is what I'm struggling with. Would you, uh, <clears throat> would you like to try to put that together quickly here for us? Is it, Maureen, is it feasible to uh, have a specification that says the code enforcement officer would, would uh, m make a review? Okay. This is part of the motion. That's right. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to propose a motion. Go right ahead. With the following findings of fact. <clears throat> One, Herb and Dor Doris Strout are requesting review of a proposed 180 foot high telecommunications tower to be located at 14 Strout Road which requires approval under section 19-9 site plan standards and section 19-8-12 tower and antenna performance standards. Two, additional information is needed to confirm that the tower will be constructed in accordance with EIA standards. Three, the use of a neutral cable color will enhance the blending of the tower into the surrounding environment. I'd like to add to that comment, uh, the use of a neutral color for cables, antennas, and alternative tower structures will enhance the blending of the tower into the surrounding environment. Four, the town of Cape Elizabeth desires to minimize the number and location of towers to the minimum needed to provide telecommunications service to the community. Five, the application of Herb and Doris Strout to construct a 180-foot high telecommunications tower located at 14 Strout Road substantially complies with section 19-9 site plan regulations and section 19-8-12 tower and antenna performance standards. Therefore, be it ordered that, based upon the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Herb and Doris Strout for site plan review and tower overlay district standards approval to construct a new 180-foot 180 foot tall telecommunications tower located at 14 Strout Road be approved with the following conditions. One, that items five, six, and seven in the town engineer's letter dated February 14, 2001, be satisfied prior to the issuance of a building permit. Two, that the cabling and all installed antenna structures of the tower be a gray color to match the tower structure if technically feasible. And three, that the tower owner not unreasonably deny the ability to, location to, to locate telecommunications equipment on the tower by telecommunications providers. Thank you. Motion's been made. I'd like to and second the motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? I'll put it to a vote. All those in favor, uh, show by raising the right hand. Those opposed? Uh, the motion has been carried. Seconded. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> The subject on the agenda is uh, Chris Thompson on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit to construct a boardwalk behind the public works garage located at 21 Denison Drive. My name is Chris Thompson. I'm a member of Boy Scout Troop 30, which is here in Cape. Uh, for the last uh, year about, I've been working on achieving the rank of Eagle Scout. And I have one more requirement to go, which is to uh, plan and carry out a project that benefits the community. 
And for my project, I've decided to build a boardwalk over a area in the Gold, on the Goldcrest property, which is off from Spurwick Avenue, behind the new uh, tran transfer the uh, public works facility. It's about a mile down here. It's just up the road on some uh, on the snowmobile trails and walking trails on that property. And I've been working with town planner Maureen O'Meara, town engineer Steve Harding, and the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission for the last five months to organize the project. <coughs> I've done a site walk with several members of the Conservation Commission and did another site walk with Mrs. O'Meara, Mr. Harding, and Mary Beth Richardson of the DEP. Uh, the boardwalk will cover an area that's quite muddy for the majority of the year, and there's a small stream that will also um, go over. And at this time, there are only several pallets laid over it, which are blocking the stream and uh, kind of dangerous to pass over it because you can fall right in. Uh, the boardwalk will not be um, constructed in the actual swamp, just a little bit to the east of it. And the majority of the area it's about, uh, is already cleared of plants and other vegetation, so the only items that would need to be removed are the existing pallets and some very small shrubs will need to be trimmed back to allow for the uh, five feet width of the bridge. It'll be about 78 feet long. And there won't be any filling needed, uh, just some, to make a little ramp to get onto the bridge. Um, it'll be built primarily of pressure treated wood for the bridging and the bracing. And material called Trex will be used, which is made up of ground up plastics for the decking. And hemlock logs will be used to lie on the ground for intermediate supports. Thank you. At this time, uh, shall we just present this to the board for discussion of completeness? completeness? I have a completeness question. Go ahead. Uh, in reviewing the application, one of the things uh, that I was wondering about is uh, exactly uh, what is the condition uh, during a, a high water or, or, or when there actually is a lot of rain and we have a, a hundred year storm. Is, is this entire area uh, flooded and uh, if so, to what, to what extent? Do you know that? Um, I've only been down there after a small rainstorm and the river was coming up quite high. Uh, during most of the year that I've been down there, it's just muddy all through it, and so if the bridge, is, if the bridge will be raised up, it's just so it's mostly muddy. I think after a, a large storm, it would get quite unpassable through there without the bridge. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. Go motion right for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Chris Thompson on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth, Elizabeth for a resource protection permit to construct a boardwalk behind the public works garage located at 21 Denison Drive be deemed complete. Thank you. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I will put it to vote. All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising the right hand. Any opposed? To carry that motion, the uh, project is deemed complete at this point. Um, the, more it, the board will uh, begin discussion regarding the project. If they have any questions of the applicant, uh, Please bring them forward now. Mr. Chairman, I have just a couple of quick questions for Chris. Um, you indicated that one of the entrances to the bridge has a slight ramp. Um, how uh, steep yeah. is the incline? Um, the, act, the actual bridge will just be right up against the, uh, the ground, and just a small ramp will just have to be added to it, just so it's level walking onto it. It wouldn't be steep or anything, okay. just so it would be easier to jump, step up onto it or anything. Just okay. And my second question is, your drawing depicts a slight angle in the bridge. It I, almost forms a V. What's the purpose yes, uh, of that Yes, there's a angle? tree right next to where it turns, and it'll turn just before the tree to move off to the side. Okay. 
and I anticipate because I know a lot of snowmobilers use that area that they will you know take opportunity and use this bridge on their snowmobiles and I asked this question at the workshop and in your opinion and the town engineers opinion it's strong enough and the angle of the bridge is not going to be a detriment to those snowmobilers no. thank you I have a question. Uh, maybe the planner could help me or the applicant. Uh, will the Conservation Commission be reviewing this and recommending anything to us? Uh, the Conservation Commission has already seen it. Um, they, they saw it uh, before it was brought to you in a workshop. And my understanding is they were the ones that asked for the boardwalk to be increased in width from four feet to five feet to accommodate the snowmobilers. And I don't believe they have any other issues with this. However, if you decide to send it to a public hearing, then they would give you some comments by next month. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. Motion for a public hearing. <clears throat> be it ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular April 23rd meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be scheduled. Motion's been made. I hear a second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to uh, have a public hearing regarding this subject. Uh, any discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, all those in favor of the motion show by raising right hand. The motion carries. Mr. Thompson, they will set a date for a, a hear public hearing and I notify you. I want to thank you for presenting the project. It'll be, it, will, it will be April 23rd. I think it's a, for those of you that are visiting us tonight, Mr. Thompson's done a lot of work at this project, and it's quite an honor to see what he's done. Uh, The next subject on our agenda this evening is the Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct a concession building and scoreboard at the Lions Field located off Ocean House Road. The planning Board has previously approved the new Little League Field and associated facilities at the site. Amendment to the site plan approval is required and resource protection permit due to the encroachment of the concession stand on the 250-foot RP1 wetland buffer district. Good evening. Hi, my name is Gary Collett. I'm with Oaks Associates. I'm here in place of Steve Harding, town engineer. Uh, with me tonight is Roger Rio of the Little League Boosters. Um, the building we're seeking approval for is located at Lions Field, uh, located off Ocean House Road, being off this sheet over here. Uh, this is the access drive to the field. Um, the building, the boost, so-called boosters, boosters building, um, which will be used for concession, a scorer's table, and storage, is located directly behind the uh, home plate backstop. Um, the building itself is a 20 by 28 foot footprint. Um, it is uh, sided on the three sides, not facing the field with natural cedar shingles. Um, the side of the building facing the ball field will be, of the siding will be textured T111 plywood units uh, painted green for the safety of the ball players and better visibility. Um, 
It's got a slope roof with dark asphalt shingles and a cupola is provided for ventilation. Um, there's also, near the backstop, there's an existing electrical panel which will be relocated um, to the interior of the building. Um, there's also an existing um, water spigot mounted on a post near to where the building will be, which will be extended to the building and mounted to the exterior of the building. Um, there's an existing walkway um, coming from the parking area to the field area. Um, the walkway is um, um, recycled bituminous pavement, which will be um, extended to the building um, at all the building entrances. Um, there will also be a, on the west side of the building, the west entrance, there will be a uh, five by five concrete pad um, to provide uh, handicap accessibility and meet um, ADA requirements. Um, <clears throat> we're also proposing to add a, uh, a scoreboard and uh, I know it was noted in the cover letter to be in right field. It will actually be in left field um, and a conduit will be, will be provided for that from the building to the, the scoreboard um, for power and um, controls. The building does encroach into the, uh, a resource protection setback. Um, and we're seeking approval for that as well. And I think that is acceptable under the ordinance because of the, um, the use of the fall field is for recreational. I believe that's it. Thank you. Been up for discussion of completeness. The application reference is a sign that's going to have Cape Elizabeth Little League on it. Uh, do you have any ideas to the size of that sign? Uh, yes, we've noted that and recently. I forgot to mention that. We've added dimensions. Um, it's located on the opposite side of the building from the field area. Um, it's located above an overhead door. Um, the overall dimensions of the sign are 9 foot by 1 foot 6 uh, with painted letters. Uh, the letters are going to be approximately 3 and 5 eighths inch high. I just have one question, if I could. Could you confirm that you don't plan to add any lighting whatsoever to the building? That's right. There, there won't be any additional lighting added to the whole, whole facility. There's an existing light uh, that provides light for the, um, the parking area for security. And um, the building itself will not have um, any lighting. It won't be heated. It won't be air conditioned. Um, there will be no additional loudspeakers. Uh, It'll be like inside, of course. Okay. No, no Thank exterior. You. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that uh, you proposed that the, sign, the scoreboard sign in the outfield has power running to it. Yes, it's. Um, is that completely an internally lit uh, piece of equipment where the numbers light up from the inside? I, I believe so. Yes. I have one question relative to the sign. Is it dimensionally correct on the drawing? This, this is to scale on the drawing, okay. yes. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead, Mr. Sir. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct a concession building and scoreboard at Lyons Field off Ocean House Road be deemed complete. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? No discussion. Uh, 
We'll take a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please show by writing, raising right hand. Motion carries. <coughs> The completeness is carried, and uh, we get into a discussion now about the project itself. Is there any discussion? Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a question about timing. Yes. Sir. Uh, if we were to defer this application to next month's meeting so that we could schedule a public hearing, does that cause any hardship for the Little League trying to get this done. Thank you. My name is Roger Rio and um, th that would we our opening day is April 29th. So we have a short period of time and our, la our closing you know where the season's over by the end of June. So if we wait another month it probably would be deferred till next year just because once we get into the season our opportunity for for volunteers and everything is, is quite limited. So we would ap appreciate that consideration, but understand if you have some concerns, we'd, we'll wait. I'd like to suggest that uh, given that this is just an amendment to a previously approved site plan application that we could, we could uh, pass judgment on it tonight and send these people on their way with, their, with our blessings or not. Any other thoughts regarding that issue? Yeah, I, from what I can tell, and Maureen can correct me, but I, there hasn't been uh, a lot of question or concern from neighbors or members of the public on this I don't project. think I've gotten one phone call or question or visit on. Um, I don't remember anyone coming in on this. So I, I guess I would not have a problem with waiving the public hearing on this, given the time constraints. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, my, my impression of it is that uh, since uh, volumetrically it's probably about four times the cubic footage of the one that's down near Fort Williams right now, and it's a fairly large structure the size of a single family house, uh, that it would probably be a good idea to have a public hearing and just see if anyone else uh, is, has noticed it. <coughs> I have <clears throat> one question of you, Mr. Rio. Is it, would it, would putting this off to next year affect your fundraising and your ability to build the project next year? Would it have much of an effect? Well, the, the tough thing is that those of us who are driving this project this year will all be out of Little League next year. We are, our, our boys are 12. So the president, uh, Jeff Bump, who's the project manager for us, and myself would be um, not involved, so it would be moved to other people to complete. It would also mean that we would lose a year of income. We expect to get uh, a considerable amount of income from this, much more than we get from uh, Playstead Park today because of convenience located right next to the field. So this would be, we, we plan a significant fundraiser for us every year. And it would serve the the two fields that are there and also plans. What we would like to do is move on to consideration of plans for a third field located at, at that Lions location, which, so deferring that would mean that the resources for Little League would be impacted and probably that project would be uh, deferred a year as well. Of course, that's off a little bit, so I'm not sure how much impact, but certainly the energies of the board would be limited. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a question for the town planner. The original plan that was approved called for a building that was 540 square feet. Is that right? Yes. Uh, but the plan did state that it, we never got specifics on that plan, okay. and, and there was a note on there that said that if they wanted to build it, they would have to come back. So it was really still conceptual at that point. For clarification, though, the, the proposed building uh, is only 
20 square feet larger than the conceptual building that was included in the original site plan review. That's right. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Cotter. Planning Board, having heard of no objections or concerns from abutters, I'd like to propose a motion. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review and resource protection distance permit to construct a concession building and scoreboard at Lyons Field off Ocean House Road be approved. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussions? If there's no discussion, then we'll take a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising their right hand. It's unanimous. You have a project to go to work on. You're welcome. The next item on our agenda tonight, the Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a site plan review for landscape improvements in the construction, reconstruction of pedestrian walkways to Portland Headlight. Would you introduce the project and bring us up to date, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. My name is Scott Collard. I'm a senior landscape architect with Land Use Consultants. And the site plan of application before you is for landscape improvements, as you've described, for the Portland headlight. The project includes walkways, construction, site improvements, and landscape improvements in the vicinity of the uh, Battery Blair <coughs> Portland headlight. The phase one budget is initially, the initial phase one budget is between $90,000 and $100,000, and the phase one work will be presented in more detail in a few minutes. A little background on this uh, project. Initially, uh, this uh, project was presented to the Planning Board during the January workshop meeting. Uh, it received approval from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission in late January. Um, and the project was referred for Planning Board review by the Town Council at their February 2001 meeting. Subsequent to that, a meeting with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has uh, worked out the details of the phase one scope and that was finalized on March 15th. Uh, as far as the project schedule is concerned, we would like to bid the phase one improvements as soon as we receive site plan approval for the spring 2000 construction season. 2001, thank you. <laughs> um, the goals of this project are threefold. First, the primary charge of the Fort Williams Commission was to ensure pedestrian safety and convenience. Secondly, it is to stabilize uh, eroded areas due to weathering and heavy foot traffic. And thirdly, to provide landscape improvements. Uh, most notably, most of the proposed improvements are in the areas of shallow and flat slopes, with uh, two notable exceptions, those being the areas uh, adjacent to the Battery Blair area, and I'll point them out on the plan here, and at the uh, upper end of the what we describe as the northern overlook, uh, where there are a set of steps uh, in the stairs. Um, a major goal of this project is to stabilize eroded areas due to heavy foot traffic and to revegetate other areas north of the uh, museum parking. 
Um, new walks will be edged with sod to provide immediate stabilization in areas adjacent to the lighthouse and scenic overlooks are proposed to have a stone paver edge or band of varying dimensions, uh, but of at least three feet in uh, dimension to provide additional uh, stability. The plan that is posted here describes what is included within the phase one budget. The areas that uh, we have come to refer to in this project include the Battery Blair approach, the Battery Blair steps and crosswalk, what we have referred to as the headlight walk, the lighthouse area, shore walk and overlook to the south of the headlight, and the shore walk and overlook to the north of the lighthouse. Phase one improvements include Battery Blair steps, here, the headlight walk and crosswalk, Oops. and thirdly, the shore walk and overlook area to the north of the lighthouse, which is being included under phase one as an additive alternate to the base bid. Although the project is called the Portland Headlight Landscape Improvements Project, reducing the number of pedestrians walking in the roadway leading to the lighthouse is one of the most important goals to be addressed. As we indicated, our primary charge from the Fort Williams Commission was to improve the safety for pedestrians. We are proposing to accomplish this by widening the sidewalk from the central parking lot uh, immediately to the uh, west of the area rendered here from seven foot wide to 10 foot wide and then uh, to, uh, which extends to a point just easterly of the proposed battery Blair steps and then to provide a new 10 foot wide walkway along the southern side of the Portland headlight parking lot. And that extends from here down to a southern overlook area. The walkway surface for this portion of the walk will be made up of the same materials that you find on the cliff walk, which is a reclaimed pavement aggregate mix with some pea-sized stone, uh, pea stone sized aggregate. Access to the lighthouse will not be changed. The eroded areas along the fence line on both the north and south sides of the lighthouse will be resurfaced with thick paving stones set in aggregate. The edge treatment is intended to stabilize soils and to provide well-defined walking and standing areas. The eroded area and path north of the lighthouse to the cliff walk will be reconstructed to match the existing cliff walk trail. The area just to the north of the staff volunteer parking spaces, seen here, uh, will be loamed and revegetated except for a walk of varying width near the fence line. An existing set of stone steps will be widened and reset and reconstructed for safety. New vegetation will include some perennials, but primarily beech plum, rosa rugosa, and juniper, mostly what we would describe as indigenous plants. Additionally, a fire rescue access area, 16 feet, 16 feet in width, with a gravel base and two inch loam and seed for emergency access, is proposed from the volunteer parking area to the fence line at the north overlook area. Um, one of the additional concerns was about accessibility. A future walk that connects the Battery Blair Memorial area westerly to the sidewalk is shown on the plans. You can see it here in an outline form. This is not intended uh, uh, Let's see, this, this proposed walk is a 5% walk and therefore uh, accommodates uh, disabled individuals. The proposed plan provides a stepped ramp from Battery Blair down to the sidewalk, and this is not intended to be uh, considered an accessible route for uh, disabled individuals. Uh, it should be noted that this uh, walkway in this area is not included as part of the phase one uh, work. The landscape, as seen on this plan, 
uh, includes drifts of shrubs and perennials on low berms that define the edge of the proposed headlight walk. Similar plantings are proposed east and north of the existing parking, uh, volunteer parking lot and north of the entrance to the Portland headlight. Shrubs and perennials are, uh, are shown on uh, our plans and all new walks will be edged with sod for quick infill and stabilization. Uh, again, we would like to emphasize that the proposed project will not affect existing traffic circulation patterns or parking. Um, one of the concerns of this project was addressing stabilization, and we have uh, conducted a study of the project um, Taking into uh, concern, uh, taking into consideration uh, issues of uh, erosion control and sedimentation, and uh, we have found that uh, uh, the proposed design meets those needs. And uh, in our project, we have endeavored to follow existing slopes and to meet existing grades. the board, is there any question regarding completeness? No motion. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Carter. If there are no questions from board members, I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of landscaping improvements and walkway construction and reconstruction at Portland Headlight be deemed complete. There's a motion from the House. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been seconded. Any discussion or questions at this point? Hearing no questions, we'll put it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising right. The motion carries at this point. Uh, <clears throat> we'll open it up for uh, discussion regarding the uh, project as a whole. Mr. McGovern. <clears throat> uh, Mike McGovern, Cape Elizabeth Town Manager, speaking on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I just would like to point out, for, particularly for the benefit of the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth, that none of this project is proposed to be funded with tax dollars. Uh, it is going to be funded by the museum at Portland Headlight, which is a separate 501c3 corporation whose funding comes from sales at the Lighthouse Gift Shop as well as admissions to the museum. Uh, also, I would like to point out that the trustees of the museum at Portland Headlight have not yet seen the cost estimates for this plan, nor seen the phasing plan. And, you know, my understanding is that you probably proceed to a public hearing on this, and I would like to clarify that, that the trustees may entertain some slight suggestion in change uh, in the, the particular phasing of this project, as they have not yet seen that phasing. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We are, tonight we are only addressing phase one, though, is that correct? Maureen? My understanding is the applicant is looking for approval of the whole project, and prior to the next month's meeting, we'll get an actual phasing plan. So would the scope of the project go well beyond what you've depicted this evening? The scope of the project would not go beyond the materials that have been submitted to the, to the town. And uh, only for purposes of presentation this evening have we focused upon those parts of the uh, proposed project that are considered at this time to be under phase one. Thank you. I have a question for the town planner. I'm just wondering how quickly we could take a look at the uh, site, um, given the importance of what lanes to the town. It, this might be helpful for me to, to go out there and take a look. 
One of the things you have to decide tonight is if you want to schedule a site walk, and if you do, you should probably try to do it before your meeting on April 23rd. That is an option for the board. Is there any other interest on a site walk? <clears throat> yes. How about scheduling it at your pleasure? typically have a site walk early in the morning around 8 o'clock on a Saturday. How about the 24th? This coming Saturday. All right. I won't be available. <laughs> <laughs> How about another time? How about the 31st? Uh, the following Saturday. Yeah, uh, that would be fine. Any other problems with that? Anything as typical, uh, we'll set up a site walk. How is that uh, with the uh, applicant? It's fine, thank you. Okay. Yeah, we could, uh, Fort Williams opens at 8, doesn't it? Yeah, we could meet. All right. Yeah, we'll be. Eight's just fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess then uh, we'll schedule a site walk for the 31st. And, uh, and uh, that'll give you time between then and uh, the next meeting. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, be further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular April 23rd, 2001 meeting of the Planning Board at which time a public hearing shall be held. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? I will second that, Mr. Chairman. Motion seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, let's put it to vote. All those in favor of the motion that's presented to show by raising the right hand. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. subject on our agenda this evening is the non-conforming lot zoning amendment <coughs> which we have scheduled a public hearing uh, before I open the hearing I'd like to make a couple of um, comments and points uh, set up some rules uh, the room seems to be well filled with citizens and I think it's important that we stay by uh, a time frame that would uh, allow anybody that has a chance to say something or wants to say something to have a chance to say it. Typically on uh, hearings like this we try to limit the presentations to three minutes per individual. We uh, uh, would hope that if somebody wishes to speak and they are going to discuss the same that somebody prior to them discussed for the sake of time and uh, we would ask that they reference that person's discussion and, and state uh, how they feel about it and, and leave it at that. We also ask that uh, prior to your presentation that you tell us who you are and your, your residence and your address and your name. Um, at, that, at this point, uh, make one other comment. There are a couple more seats down front here if people want to sit down. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a suggestion prior to beginning the public hearing. Yes. There's, there's been a, a fair amount of discussion about when were the rules changed, at what point in time 
did the zoning ordinance change such that the uh, lots which are currently not buildable under the ordinance became not buildable. Uh, there was an ordinance change in 1997. There was a set of technical corrections in 1999. I think it's important for both the members of the board and the public to understand when that took place. And I thought maybe before the hearing, Maureen might be able to comment on that for our benefit. Thank you. If that would be all right. Um, well, on the podium tonight, what I did is uh, make a copy of some materials, most of which I think you've seen before, but I just want to walk you through it. Um, at the top is a memo dated July 14, 1998, from the Code Enforcement Officer. When the zoning ordinance amendments were adopted in uh, 1997, a commitment was made to revisit them in a year. There was an expectation that inevitably there would be glitches and the need to clarify provisions. And uh, in the year that we used the ordinance, the Code Officer made a list of things that uh, he would like to recommend be tightened up. I'd like to call your attention to item six on his list of 15 items where he references the section that we're dealing with non-conforming lots. He states, it has been my interpretation that the minimum lot area in the chart is a requirement that must be met for an existing vacant lot, a non-conforming lot of record only, and does not apply to developed lots. If this is the case, there's a need to change the format to clarify. Uh, I also spoke to the uh, town attorney this afternoon who remembered his original discussion with the code enforcement officer on this particular issue. And both he and the code enforcement officer agree that the amendment to the ordinance in 1999 was in fact a technical amendment. It did in no way change the interpretation of the, how the chart applied to vacant non-conforming lots of record. Uh, prior to 1997, there, there has long been a history of there being a minimum lot size for non-conforming lots, both for lots served by sewer and by septic systems. Uh, so it was, is, it was the town attorney's feeling and the code enforcement officer's feeling that all of the amendments that were proposed in 1999, which we called technical amendments, were in fact amendments intended to clarify existing policy, not to make new policy. The only types of new policy that were made in 1999 uh, had to do with the installation of home businesses and home occupations and accessory structures. And they were identified as minor policy changes. Uh, the other thing that you have in your package, and I don't think you've ever seen this before, is um, when, the, when the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee was working on a new ordinance, uh, once we had a draft, they would get a draft that would be marked up. And what I've done is just giving you a copy of the, the page that originally had the non-conforming chart. And as you can see, it's covered with corrections, including a correction uh, where staff uh, mixed up the numbers for minimum lot size for septic and subsurface disposal. Uh, so I can demonstrate that there was at least a moment in the 18 months that the Zork Committee met where uh, the minimum lot size for non-conforming lots was discussed. I can also show you underneath where that change was made. Further, uh, there are minutes from the April 18, 1996 meeting, the April 3, 1996 meeting, the March 27, 1996 meeting, and the March 20, 1996 meeting. At all four of those meetings, the nonconformance section of the zoning ordinance was discussed, was reviewed. Um, the real problem with that section at that time was that it was never intended to be a section where the Zork Committee was supposed to be doing a lot of work. The intent was to just reformat it. The problem was that the old ordinance was in such um, shambles that it was difficult to understand exactly what it said. Um, and I'd like to say that at least we don't seem to be having that problem as much anymore. Um, it was not a topic that took a lot of their time. Um, it wasn't supposed to take a lot of their time, but it was a topic of discussion. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that uh, based on the staff's recommendation, the change that occurred that has created the current quandary uh, was part of the 1997 zoning ordinance adoption. Thank you, Maureen. At this time, I will open the hearing and uh, suggest that those that want to speak uh, form on the right side of the room and line up be behind the podium. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Paul Vos, and um, I own a home at 21 Linwood Street, but I'm also an owner of a non-conforming uh, vacant lot on Ocean Avenue, and that's um, what I'm here to speak about tonight. In 1996, I purchased a buildable lot on Ocean Avenue. Later, I was told by the code enforcement officer that it was no longer buildable due to a zoning change. It was explained to me that the zoning ordinance adopted by the town in 1997 had made my land unbuildable. This explanation directly contradicted what I understood the intent of the new ordinance to be. Um, I had made a point of following the process of the adoption of the new ordinance in 1997. I had just purchased my building lot um, and I was aware that a new zoning ordinance was being created and I wanted to be certain that my lot would remain buildable under the new ordinance. On two different occasions, I visited Town Hall and the Code Enforcement Office to review the proposed draft mentioned in the Cape Courier articles and to speak with the Code Enforcement Officer for interp <coughs> excuse me, interpretations of the draft as the Courier article directed. And these both occasions occurred prior to the adoption of the ordinance in 1997. On both occasions, I was assured that my property would remain buildable by the code enforcement officer under the new ordinance and that the language that was there, it was explained to me in general terms that I understood and I accepted. So when I discovered in 1999 that my property rights had been taken, I immediately set out to have them restored. I appeared before the town council and I requested that the technical amendments of 1999 be reconsidered by the town because in my opinion um, these and as I understood it these technical amendments were intended to clarify the 1997 ordinance as Maureen just explained as well. At the technical amendments hearing there was never any mention of removing the minimum lot size waiver from the ordinance but it's my opinion that that is exactly what happened. Without warning, my property rights were taken from me. I had no notice, nothing. They were just gone. And I would like to have my property rights restored. Since the technical amendments were designed to clarify the intent of the 1997 ordinance, the following question must be addressed. Did the council, Zork, and planning board intend to eliminate the minimum lot size waiver in 1997? In my opinion, the answer is a resounding no. Former councillors Jordan, Groff, Reed, Linnell, Chapel, Coggeshell, and Dahlbeck all submitted letters to the town and to you stating that as a member of the council and Zork, it was never their intention to deprive any property owner of their right to build without full public discussion and notification of affected property owners. Phyllis Coggeshell, former town councillor and Zork chair, states in her letter, and I'll, I'll quote it to you, I'll read it right from her letter. Excuse me. The overriding intent was to keep the public informed as to the process through advertised committee and council meetings, articles in the Cape Courier, and televised public information meetings and public hearings. The town planner did considerable research with the information and records available at the time. If there was any possibility of an unreasonably negative impact on a property, notification was sent to the owner. Former Councillor Joe Groff. I was at many Zork meetings in my role as a member of the town council and chairman of the town council. At all times, that I was involved in any consideration relating to Zork, it was always the overriding philosophy that anybody who had any rights which were going to be impacted by Zork have a full opportunity to be heard. No one with a position of authority in the town wanted any individual property owner to be surprised by any subsequent interpretation of any of the provisions in Zork. I find it inconceivable that the town council, the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board, or any town official would take the position that a technical correction regarding confusing language could be construed to preclude a Cape Elizabeth property owner from exercising, <coughs> excuse me, from exercising the right to build on a grandfathered lot. The overriding philosophy of Zork was to plan and shape the town's future 
with as little impact as possible on the existing property rights of individuals. To the extent that there were contemplated impacts on the rights of property owners, all public officials involved in the passing of Zork made public disclosure their highest priority in an attempt to have all impacted individuals understand the issues. From the town planner's own notes, which she was good enough to allow me to see and copy. People in same situation should be treated the same way. And I will wrap up quickly here, because I do understand we have some time limits on this. There was no public discussion or notification of such a proposed change. There is no public record of any such discussion occurring at any public meeting in any of the minutes. I have been told by the town planner that the proposal before you does restore the minimum lot size waiver. I've also been told by the town planner and code enforcement officer that the sewage ordinance language contains, I'm sorry, that the sewage ordinance contains language permitting use of the minimum lot size waiver today and that no specific reference in the zoning ordinance is necessary. If the council did not eliminate the minimum lot size waiver in 1997, which they did not, then the technical amendments are incorrect. As a result, my property rights were taken without any notice and they should be restored. I know there is opposition to my request, but I wonder how many people are aware that this is a request for restoration of rights which were taken as a result of a mistake. This is not new zoning. This is a request to restore rights. When I first became aware of this problem and brought the issue forward, I was not specifically aware of others similarly affected property owners. I now know that there are others who lost their property rights as I did. I know this because as a result of this issue, a study has now been conducted to identify and notify owners of non-conforming lots. Had this issue been contemplated in 1997, this study would have been done at that time. And, as is the policy of our town, people would have been notified, like me. Again, this is proof that this was never intended by Zork, the Planning Board, or the Town Council in 1997. Our town's comprehensive plan has been discussed in letters as a reason to deny this request. Nowhere in our town's comprehensive plan does it suggest that property owners' rights should be taken from them. A mistake has been made. Mistakes happen. It's how they're handled that matters. And I would ask you to please correct this mistake and please restore my property rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Good evening. My name is Rosemary Reed. I live at 1 Dean Way. I'm not in a butter tending the affected areas. I am, however, a former town councilor, a member of Zork. I wrote you a letter in September of 19, uh, excuse me, 2000, when I first became aware of this, and I wrote you another letter this week with a typo in line four that's took, not look. Otherwise, I think you can understand my meaning. Uh, I appreciate that Worrying went through and gave us a little bit of a, an overview about what happened, but out of those 18 meetings, I believe her minutes will suggest uh, or prove that I was at 15 of them, um, that the code enforcement officer referenced in the uh, beginning here is not the current code enforcement officer who served, was not the code enforcement officer who sat on the Zork committee ex officio. Also, I will uh, disagree with Maureen on the point uh, about the uh, discussion at four meetings, although ever so slight, regarding minimum lot size waivers. We may have discussed non-conforming lots. I will uh, attest that we did not discuss minimum lot size waivers. Also, technical corrections are supposed to clarify, not change, not make policy. I've spoken with members of the 1999 Council who can speak for themselves, but I will tell you that they did not know they were making a policy change, and I am offended at the fact that as a member of the 1997 Council, after serving on Zork, 
that I could be accused of taking away building rights from not only Mr. Vos, but as many as 30 other people without notice. I think it is absolutely awful that we are coming to this point tonight to have the discussion that had we intended to do what has been done, we would have had a meeting like this three years ago with this many people, and we would have been more careful at the language that we used. I did not vote ever to take away a person's rights without notice, nor is it the practice of this town to do so. Thank you. I'm uh, David Bolden. I live at 17 Lawson Road, and I've been wanting to do this all night. <laughs> I know it's not much, and I have to say that I'm, I'm here primarily for one reason, and that reason comes into one word. That word is fear. Uh, we moved here 25, almost 25 years ago now to that little uh, neighborhood on Pond Cove for all of the very many reasons that people come to Cape Elizabeth. The experience has been wonderful for my family, for my children, uh, for everyone in the neighborhood who has come to know that as a, as a place to really be treasured. This little map, which I got when we first moved in, shows the way the lots are divided, and I was not really aware of this situation until very recently. So I broke this map out and took a look at it, and all of a sudden I discovered that I indeed was an owner of one of these lots that could be built upon. And I fear that it would completely change the nature and character of the neighborhood. And I act partially from a selfish standpoint in standing up here in front of you because it's going to affect my neighborhood, and I think very negatively. But I also feel it's going to affect other parts of Cape Elizabeth negatively. Thank you. Uh, my name is Glenn Prentice. I live at 18 Ocean Avenue. And, and I have both uh, what I'd like to present, and two people had to leave tonight and asked me to read uh, what they had to say. Um, I have some audio visual aids. in a minute. Uh, Mr. Vose has his issues, and of course I have my issues and reasons I think that I have legal rights for what I asked for, but uh, it was decided long ago by this planning board that this should not be decided by what Mr. Vose wants or by what I want, and we should uh, not allow the issues that I feel and he feels to distract us from uh, the real agenda here tonight. And that agenda is that this ordinance proposal for Cape, is this ordinance proposal for Cape Elizabeth a good thing as a whole? And that's what I want to speak to. I'm going to do that by referencing the comprehensive plan out of which the current ordinance grew. The comprehensive plan is a mission statement for Cape Elizabeth. It's really a mandate for conservation and protection of Cape Elizabeth. It's really the North Star of the Cape's future and we should stick to it. The issue at hand should not be treated as a mundane and unrelated matter with respect to the comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan makes three points which are relevant uh, to this issue. The first is that quality of life is a jeopardy in Cape due to increased urban density. And to quote from the comprehensive plan, there is a strong community consensus that the town should take all reasonable steps to preserve the rural character of Cape Elizabeth. There is a strong community consensus that too much development has occurred in the last decade. This development has occurred on land of marginal suitability and in general has not contributed to the shared community values 
that were espoused by the 1981 comprehensive plan. Given the pattern of growth in recent years and the amount of land that could rapidly fall into the real estate market, the town is at a critical turn in the road where it must either choose to accept relentless urbanization of essentially all of its open space or elect to adopt an aggressive system of controls. This plan seeks to affect such an aggressive system of controls. It is essential to stress that the adoption of this comprehensive plan necessarily requires a prompt and consistent community response to ensure that its approach and philosophy are effectively carried out. Cape Elizabeth's open space is uniquely at risk. The second point from the comprehensive plan is that there are septic concerns, especially in the two lights, Fowler Road and Crescent Beach areas. Again, to quote from the comprehensive plan, private septic problems are likely to occur or currently are occurring in portions of Fowler Road and the two lights in Crescent Beach areas. There is a probability of future sept uh, subsurface septic system failure. And the third point is that both the current and previous comprehensive plan call for directing growth away from areas requiring septic systems. The current comprehensive plan intended to better control this problem than its predecessor, and again to quote, the last comprehensive plan and the resulting land use regulations attempted to direct growth to those areas served by public, public sewer. Recent residential growth, however, has occurred in both sewered and unsewered sections of the town. Yet this proposed ordinance is first to protect sewered areas from lot size reduction because there would be too many lots. At the same time, to increase urban density in much smaller area neighborhoods requiring septic. And because these lots are much, much less than half the size of the sewer areas, I don't see how it can be reasonable that the 61 lots that had been uh, considered in sewer areas would be too many, but 32 uh, would not be too many for areas requiring septic. And that's the point on this map. You can see the blue are sewer areas. The orange without blue around it, of which there's almost none, it's clearly much less than half, maybe a quarter, is the area where the proposal would put new lots. And somehow the idea is that 32 lots in these small areas would be too many, but 61 in all this space would be, re would be unreasonable. It's difficult to understand that. Uh, so really, this proposal, this ordinance, uh, proposes exactly the opposite of what is called for the, by the comprehensive plan. And I cannot understand why we want to move in that direction. We should be seeking to enforce rules rather than to proliferate exceptions. The final point I want to make is that if we allow this ordinance change, we put the cape on a slippery slope. 32 lots are under consideration now, but if this ordinance change occurs, it will be only the beginning. If the town reduces buildable lot size for some lots, on what basis will it deny others the same consideration? Lots of less than 10,000 square feet in any neighborhood, sewer or septic, would have equal claim to development. There are a large number of such lots in older subdivisions. This proposal would destabilize neighborhoods erode our town's rural character and compromise its environmental values. And I have an example of that as well. This is my neighborhood and the neighborhood that Mr. Rose hopes to uh, build in. Well, I, I maybe... Uh, just wanted to point out, this is where the comprehensive plan says development should occur. We're proposing none there, we're only proposing in this small area again. But, but this is uh, the actual lot map of this subdivision. So there are 32 developed properties here. There are actually 54 legal lots. 
Now, some of them are not 10,000 square feet. Many of them are 8,000 something and so forth. But if we're going to talk about property rights being the uh, determining factor on whether one can build, we really open the floodgate here potentially. And if I could read the, the letter from my neighbor who had to leave, I, I might add all the abutters oppose this amendment change. This is how my wife, Pamela J. Ott, and myself, Michael G. Ott, of 16 Ocean Avenue, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, feel about any more houses in this area. We have lived in our house for over 35 years now and are the longest living people on the road. We have seen a lot of changes, some for the good, some for the worst. Uh, if this lot at 20 Ocean Avenue is a buildable lot, that means that my double lot, along with others on this road, can be sold and built on. If this happens, the next thing we will look, uh, the next thing we will look like is Higgins Beach with no room to breathe. My wife and I are opposed to any more building of new homes. And finally, I'd like to read a letter from Seal Simpson, also from Ocean Avenue, who had to leave. She says, Dear Sirs, I oppose the proposed amendment of, to the zoning ordinance that would reduce nonconforming lot size from 20,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet in unsewered areas of the town. This amendment will have a negative impact on the town of Cape Elizabeth, impacting the town's infrastructure and adding stress to already densely populated areas of town, creating a situation of excessive growth and development. Further, the additional septic system resulting, systems resulting from this amendment will adversely impact the environment a natural setting that the town has worked hard to conserve. The proposal is flawed, as can be seen by your having backed away from pursuing it in sewered areas. It is not designed or intended to benefit the majority of Cape residents. It is designed to gratify the special interests of a few to the detriment of many. It violates specific sections of the comprehensive plan. How can you feel that the comprehensive plan is not important in this case? As representatives of the people of Cape Elizabeth, I ask that you reject this amendment and preserve the future of Cape Elizabeth. Very truly yours, Seal Simpson. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Carol Dean, and I'm your next door neighbor, a, a resident of South Portland. But I'm here tonight um, to read the letter written by a friend of mine, Denise LaRue, who lives in Cape Elizabeth with her husband, Bob Furman, and their children. She says, I oppose the proposal to allow building on 10,000 square foot lots in areas requiring septic systems. New neighborhoods being designed today require 20,000 square foot lots where septic systems are needed. And when allowed, small lots on public sewer systems must be surrounded by ample open space. These town planning concepts highlight septic safety and acknowledge the importance of open space for the preservation of natural beauty, the peacefulness and privacy that open space provides, and protection of the local wildlife habitat. I cannot understand why the town planners are proposing treating older subdivisions any differently. The proposal to reduce the buildable lot size in septic areas to 10,000 square feet treats older neighborhoods as if urban density and quality of life for those residents is not important. This old Cape, new Cape discrimination is for the benefit of a few developers who would like to profit from increased building in established neighborhoods, some of which have been around for 50 to 100 years. 
In no way does it further the comprehensive plan's goal of reducing density to protect the unique character and beauty of the existing neighborhoods. Why should older neighborhoods be subject to a building free for all when new neighborhoods would not allow anything close to this kind of land abuse? Why should we reverse the protections put in place by the current ordinance? What has changed? The ordinance change proposed by the planning board will create more overcrowding and will set a precedent for further building in existing neighborhoods. Do we want to imitate the growth that has occurred in South Portland or Old Orchard Beach? My husband Bob and I strongly oppose this change and hope that the planners and counselors will not subject the Cape to this kind of deterioration. Thank you. My name is Dana Crovo. I live at uh, 3 Fox Hill Road in Cape Elizabeth, and I'd just like to add my voice to the two preceding speakers, or three, in, in opposition to the proposed change. Um, it seems to me the board has the responsibility to balance the rights of any individual property owner with the rights of the rest of us whose property values are directly affected by the density of the town and the character of the town. Uh, it seems to me that the comprehensive plan sets out a rational way to to preserve that character, uh, the reason that we came up here from Boston and chose this town to live in um, is primarily because of that sort of commitment uh, to preserving open space. Um, this proposal clearly benefits a minority of citizens of the town over the majority, and uh, thank you. Thank you. My name is Kenneth Rogers. I live at uh, 14 Bayberry Lane. Um, my home abuts property that would be affected by this amendment. Um, I'm here tonight to voice my opposition to the proposed amendment. Um, by profession, I'm an engineer, but I'm not here to speak as a professional. I'm speak to, here to speak as a citizen of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I chose to live with my family in Cape Elizabeth for its quality of life and the desire to control go growth. The land purchases that were made to preserve natural walkways and green as a community is a good example of this. I look at the neighbors in Scarborough, Westbrook, South Portland, Gorham, and I see congestion, overcrowded conditions, children going to school in trailers, and I ask myself, what have we learned? Is that what we want in this community? I also look at Cape Elizabeth with a vision, a vision that's captured in the comprehensive plan and I see a way of protecting the new, unique nature that we have in this community. And based on that, I feel this amendment has to be addressed by asking certain questions. What benefit does this amendment bring to the community of Cape Elizabeth? Does it improve the quality of life? Who does it benefit? Does it benefit all the citizens or just a few? Does the proposed amendment meet the vision and principles of Cape Elizabeth? To me, the answers are obvious. I ask you as representatives of the Cape people of Cape Elizabeth to reject this amendment. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Tom Tinsman. I'm a resident at uh, 52 Columbus Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm also a property owner in the town and a business uh, property owner. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history which Paul has already touched on with this proposal. And I really strongly believe, especially with what I've heard from a couple of people talk about, if they really knew the facts here, they wouldn't be saying what they're saying. This proposal is to restore building rights. This is not a proposal to reduce property sizes so that some people who did not have rights will be receiving rights. And I wonder how many of the people here tonight speaking op in opposition to this proposal would be speaking in opposition if they were the ones that lost their property rights. How many of those people bought a lot that was buildable and then became unbuildable? Um, I, I would suspect none of them. Back in 1996, our ordinance provided for the ability to apply for a state minimum lot size waiver. It was written right in our ordinance. As a matter of fact, I was the owner of the lot that Paul Votes currently owns. I went through the process with the town and with the state, and this lot was proven 
to be a buildable lot. I was issued a letter from this town saying that I could apply for a building permit. Paul Vos bought this lot in good faith as a building lot, knowing that he could build on that lot. He took time to save up money to build the right home on the, on the property, as it does have a nice ocean view. He wanted to build the right house. I've read some of the space organization's letter and literature that's gone out to a bunch of people with disinformation and lies that this will only benefit a few developers. And I'm hoping that the, the planning board has read through some of the letters from property owners who currently own lots that are affected by this, whose lot privileges were taken away from them unbeknownst to them. I am aware that whenever a town makes a major amendment change or, or a policy change, that they try as best as they can to notify people who will be affected by these changes. This was not done in 1997. It was not done in 1999. So my question is, how would anybody know who was affected by this have the ability to come up and speak before the changes were made to be able to have their say in court, so to speak? The ordinance was changed in 1997, and somehow the new ordinance did not have the wording that allowed the roadmap to go and receive the state minimum lot size waiver. It disappeared. I've read through some of the minutes, I've talked to counselors, I've, I've had meetings with, with town officials, and I am told that it was not the intention of any of the votes given to take property rights away from the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Now, currently, we still have the state minimum lot size waiver in our plumbing code. And I'm being told, and I've seen literature that says it's also in our sewage ordinance, and that it might be a duplication of effort to also have it in our building code. Maybe that's the reason it disappeared, I don't know. But your building codes are different from your plumbing codes and your sewage codes. You, you go by different s stipulations. Now, if the sewage code says you can put a subsurface waste disposal system or septic tank on your lot, that's fine. But our building code says you can't build a house with it. Now, some of the disinformation that's out there currently is that this is a new change in our town policy, that what you're about to consider will be creating new lots that we never had before, infill lots, as I've heard them called, to benefit just a few developers. We just heard from an individual who owns one of these lots. And he's afraid of the fact that lot will be developed on. Well, he owns the lot. If he decides not to build on it, don't build on it. This is not something that's before you to say everybody who owns one of these lots has to build on it. But at the same time, if someone had the right to build on their lot and it was taken away from them without their knowledge, I think the only reasonable thing to do and to expect that this town would do would be to restore those rights. And that's what you're being asked to do. Now, I wasn't going to mention it, but I think I must. That Mr. Prentice, when he got up and talked about the neighborhood that he lived in, I lived in that neighborhood for over 20 years. I know the people in that neighborhood. When I lived in that neighborhood, he was not a resident. He purchased his house about a year ago. His lot is a 10,000 square foot lot. And it's the classic case of, I've got mine, you're not going to have yours. His house looks across Mr. Vos's lot at the ocean. He's afraid that a house will be built there, and it may take some of his ocean view. Well, it's not his ocean view. Uh, he does not own the view, and he's just recently uh, invested tens of thousands of dollars in this house that's on a 10,000 square foot lot. Now, how anybody can get up in front of a group of people and say, I've got mine, but I don't want him to have his, is beyond me. And I'd be embarrassed to stand up here and say that. In closing, I would ask the town restore the building rights, or at least the minimum lot size waiver from the state, 
so that the people who had their rights before would be able to have their rights again. This is not to create new lots. I've heard the comprehensive plan quoted and talked about. I challenge anyone to find in the comprehensive plan where it says that let's take the rights away from those who have them for the benefit of others. I don't think it's in there. Thank you. <clears throat> since, since I've sort of been personally uh, attacked, I would say I'd like to have a quick response, if I could. Um, first of all, it's true that my, uh, I bought a house on a 10,000 square foot lot, and, uh, and it's understood that if there are already structures, I mean, there are lots on 5,000 square foot lots where I live, uh, that uh, Nobody's saying that those houses can't exist. As Mr. Tinsman and Mr. Vose both well know, I've tried to buy his property so that uh, it wouldn't be built on and so that he wouldn't lose anything. So to say I'm a hypocrite is hypocritical, frankly. Second thing I would like to say is that if we're really, I just want to stress again that if we're going to say that the ownership of a lot of record means that it's buildable, then we have taken away rights from hundreds and hundreds of people, and it doesn't make any sense to say it should be a 10,000 square foot lot, it should be any lot. So the logic here is absolutely flawed. Good evening, my name is Mary Ellen Whiteman. I live at 1185 Shore Road. I just wanted to speak briefly in opposition to the amendment. I wanted to talk about my concerns. Um, that would be setting a dangerous precedent um, if it's accepted. I think Mr. Prentice already spoke about the slippery slope, so I don't want to go into a great detail about that. But it seems to me that if the lot sizes are, re are allowed to be built on at 10,000 square feet with septic, then there will be what rational basis would there be to deny um, the next person who has also got a lot at, who, that is a smaller lot? Um, We've lived in Cape Elizabeth since 1996, but I grew up in a, a city neighborhood where we lived close enough not only to see what our neighbors were watching on TV, but we could see what, their, what snacks they were eating. And in Cape Elizabeth, um, part of our reason for living here is our belief that there's a perce our perception, at least, about the town's commitment to respect the natural beauty and spaciousness in our community. Um, I think. As an attorney, when I hear um, someone say that you know no one that this waiver suddenly disappeared, my experience with legislation and law has been when something changes in a law, it's usually because someone intends for that to happen, and to to say that you know this waiver that they're talking about suddenly disappeared and what nobody meant for that to happen, I am concerned about that type of um, interpretation of what happened. Uh, I would say that the 20,000 square foot limit that was set was set for good reason, and I ask that you can t continue to support the carefully considered comprehensive plan and oppose this amendment. Good evening. My name is John Painter, and I live at Six Beacon Lane in the Two Lights area of Cape Elizabeth, and I'm here to speak in opposition. Uh, but I'm also here to uh, offer a, a possible solution. Um, I live in a, uh, a home that I bought a couple of years ago, which was purchased after the 1997 change was made. And I live across the street from uh, some land that might be developed if this new ordinance is enacted. So uh, I sympathize with Mr. Vose in a way uh, I believe that if it can be demonstrated that proper notice was not given, uh, it's possible that he may have a hardship which could be referred to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I would offer that as a solution for other lot owners, individual cases, that individual cases be heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals and considered uh, as individual cases and uh, in individual neighborhoods so that abutting landowners can be consulted and possibly compromised. Uh, compromises can be made on uh, view problems and stuff like that. 
I bought a home here in Cape, uh, as I say, two years ago. And I believe I would be losing some of my property rights because I purchased a home which is across the street from land which at the time I purchased it was uh, unbuildable under current law. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm speaking in opposition, but I'm also trying to offer some sympathy to Mr. Vos and to others who may have not received uh, proper notice of this change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris James. I've uh, lived with my wife in Cape Elizabeth for 26 years. And in 1978, I bought a 13,000 square foot lot adjoining my house. And it's my hope that one day I'll be able to build on it. I had it surveyed in the early 90s. It'll support a septic system. And unfortunately, now I find that those, uh, my hopes are probably not to be. And I would just urge you to, again, restore my rights. Thank you. Mr. James? Mr. James, Mr. could James. you tell us what your address is, please? Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, 1008 Sawyer Road. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Diane Dusso, and I have resided at 19 Crescent View Avenue for the past 28 years. My property abuts the east side of one of the lots in question. I am in support of and sympathetic to Marguerite and Glenn Prentice, who in January of 2000 were told at Town Hall that the vacant lot adjacent to the home they wish to purchase is not buildable. With that information, they purchased the home at 18 Ocean View Avenue and underwent extensive renovations, taking advantage of the Ocean View. Should a home now be allowed to be constructed, the property, their property would be devalued due to the loss of that view. I object to the proposal to decrease the lot size of those lots which require septic systems. From a personal point of view, I would lose the openness I enjoy on the west side of my property. I would also lose the late afternoon sun, which would be blocked by a building on that side of my house. However, my main concern is as follows. The purpose of the 1997 ordinance to increase the size of lots being serviced by septic systems is to prevent septic density as well as polluted groundwater. My question to you, the planning board, is what has changed? I have a copy of a letter that I would like to read, but I believe you have a copy of it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the writer of the letter requested that it be written into the minutes. If we, if we have that letter, it's on file with us. If it was addressed to the planning board, it's probably not necessary for you to read it. Okay, it's from another rebutter who opposes the ordinance. Could you give us the name of that letter? Diane Eldridge. And the date of it? March 15, 2001. Yes, we got that tonight. You all have that, so that will be entered in with the minutes. Okay, thank you. Good evening, I'm Terry Garmy, and I live at One Garden Lane, and I have very little to say. I think it unfortunate that someone has suggested that um, Mr. Prentice's motives are different than they might be. I think I uh, am sympathetic with the proponent of this ordinance, having heard his story tonight, because uh, he makes an argument that he didn't get the benefit of what he bargained for. But it's unreasonable, if not um, blind, to ignore the fact that many people purchased property in Cape Elizabeth thinking that what the Cape said in 97 or 99, even if what they meant to say is, whoops, we didn't mean it, meant what it said. Apparently, we live in a town where a city council can go back and say, we didn't mean what we said. And somebody like Mr. Prentice, relying on what the town said, and any reasonable lawyer would have given him the same advice, 
that he was investing in a piece of property next to an unbuildable lot. He could pay more than the lot was worth if he were buying a lot next to a buildable lot. He could invest more in that property and not be afraid to throw his money down the drain because he could rely on what this town said. So I just want you folks to know that it's not so easy to suggest that you can make right for one person and not make wrong for another. And for those people who purchased or improved their property, relying on what they thought this town meant in 97 and 99, and did so with reason, they are also affected by the decision you make here tonight. I thought Mr. Prentice, frankly, was uh, quite a um, gallant almost in trying to objectify his analysis here. But, uh, but there are a lot of things. Uh, it's like a balloon. You're pushing on one side and out it pops on the other. Thanks a lot. Uh, Bruce Dunphy at 25 Algonquin Road. I found it unusual that Mr. Garmy wouldn't have much to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we should have all been fighting against the bridge from Portland to South Portland so that we could have stopped everybody from coming to <coughs> Elizabeth. And we should, certainly shouldn't have gone after the new school that we put in or the new public works building or the new police department that we want to do. Uh, I am one of the owners of the non-conforming lots. Uh, knowing that my rights were changed, I didn't, but I got a letter finally in the mail and I came here tonight to find out what the story was. When I bought my, my property, there were three lots that my, property, that my house sat on and one lot that was purchased for protection of view. And, uh, my wife and I often spoke about someday when we retired and got old, or older than we are now, uh, that we may build a house on that lot. But we certainly haven't had any thoughts about doing that. And, uh, but to hear somebody's rights being taken away, uh, I find it appalling that the town would do that intentionally. Uh, the problems really started in the 50s and the 60s when a lot of these developments were, were uh, started in Cape Elizabeth. And I go back to that era. Uh, I grew up in the area, you know, down in the Sherwood Forest area. The lots are very small. I think what most people object to today is people want to move to Cape Elizabeth and they want to have a nice house. And what's happening is a lot of these 10,000 square foot lots are being ripped down and monsters are being erected on them. And they don't conform with what's already in the neighborhood. And I think that's what a lot of people are really objecting to it. If you drive down Shore Road, it wasn't like it was 25 years ago. There are houses that are big enough uh, to house all of us in there right now. <laughs> so uh, I have no intentions of building on that lot that I own. And if I were to, it would certainly take away from the value of the property I have behind it. But it should be my right uh, to do that. And one thing that, the, that I'm surprised by, if they're worried about impact in the town, with the current sewer, why they allowed so many people that the sewer has come by their house and they're still to this day not hooked into the sewer. And this town didn't mandate people be hooked into the sewer when the, when the sewer went by. So if worried about impact in the sewer, then why don't you mandate that everybody where the sewer does go by today has to hook into that sewer? Thank you. I'm Dan Lakeman of 22 Beacon Lane in the Two Lights area, and I, I do not agree with the proposed ordinance change. I, I believe it's counter to the intent of the comprehensive plan for the town. But I've been asked to speak on behalf of five Cape residents who are unable to be here tonight and who would like to go on record with their opposition to this proposed change. Uh, much of what these residents have conveyed to me in uh, writing uh, has already been addressed tonight, but I, I'd like to specifically mention a few concerns uh, that they mentioned. Elizabeth Elliott and Brian Kump of 2 Bayberry Lane object, again, on the basis of the reduced lot size not being adequate to handle a septic system after a house and garage are put on it. And they ask uh, that little has changed in the development of septic systems and completion of the sewer system since the 20,000 square foot minimum lot size was determined. So they believe it seems futile to debate this issue at this time. 
They also believe that several lots in their neighborhood, which is in the Great Pond area, uh, would become developable and that further development would create additional runoff which could hurt the Great Pond environment, an issue that the environmental issues, of course, are addressed in the comprehensive plan. Uh, Indrit Riso of 38 Woodland Road I request you vote no because it, he believes it betrays the intent of the comprehensive plan by encouraging building in areas where increased septic density would exacerbate problems that are already occurring. Uh, also, finally, uh, Virginia Panarese and Ken Remitz, who are direct of butters to a lot that would become developable as a result of this ordinance change, object because of the precedent that this change would set and because it would jeopardize the whole plan uh, it, for the benefit of a few. They ask, and I think this is important, that if this law passes, since the plan has been adopted, developers and private homeowners have had their own plans rejected or modified to accommodate the comprehensive plan. And they ask that if this law passes, would these people have the right to appeal? The comprehensive plans developed to protect our environment, our financial investments, the overall character of the town, and our quality of life. When we change the ordinances to accommodate one or more developers or homeowners, the underpinnings of the plan may buckle. How do, do we then say no to the next request for change? Thank you on behalf of these residents and myself. I realize I've already spoken. I'd just like to address one point. I'll take less than one minute to do it. Could you? Uh, or I'll be glad to wait. Could you uh, sit back for a minute? Sir. Let everybody that hasn't spoken speak, and then, then you're welcome to come on. My name is Marguerite Prentice, and I live at 18 Ocean Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. Um, but first, uh, before I... Um, begin my presentation, I, I was wondering if I could ask Maureen a question. We've had, com is that allowed? I would think you could, go ahead. Basically, I, I wanted to ask you what kind of notice is given when um, these ordinance changes are made? Um, I guess I divide the ordinance notification into two categories, what is legally required and what we usually do above and beyond the legal requirement. Uh, when an amendment is made to the text of the ordinance, um, a text amendment can affect many property owners throughout the town. And we typically do not analyze every single lot that will be impacted by a text amendment. So the only requirement is that there be a legal ad posted in a newspaper of general circulation that usually is the Press Herald. Um, what we always do in addition to that is we also post articles in the Cape Courier. More recently, we've put articles in the town website, um, and we do make an effort uh, to let people know, but we don't have the opportunity to analyze, say, the impact of changing words or phrases in a particular set of uh, text amendments. If you're amending uh, the zoning map, however, that becomes a geographic area which is easily identifiable uh, we are required by, by law, and we also do it, in, even if we didn't need to, is we send a, a first-class mailed notice to every person who is in the area that will be changed or abuts the area that will be changed. We usually include in the notice a map that shows uh, what the where the change is located. Um, an example of that would be uh, just recently we added a zoning district to the town center. Uh, we sent a, a map with a notice to everyone that was within the change in the town center and everyone that abutted that change. I think it was about 30 property owners. We've changed shoreland zoning, and that affects huge numbers of people, and we will send notices to all those people as well. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. um, when I purchased my property in January of 2000, I relied on the current ordinance that's in place. And when I researched the purchase, the ordinance seemed like a reasonable standard to me. And now that I've had time to study it carefully, I think that it's actually a really good ordinance. And it's my hope that um, it will not be changed. I think it furthers the vision of the comprehensive plan 
it protects densely populated areas from overdevelopment, and it protects the environment. Um, my particular presentation tonight had to do with, um, has to do with concerns of um, septic density. Um, this amendment, if passed, will increase septic density in areas populated with more septic systems than would ever be considered acceptable by today's standards. Just one of the many environmental hazards posed by septic systems is the accumulation of nitrogen in groundwater. Excessive nitrogen is dangerous to marshes and tidal ponds because it promotes the abundant growth of algae. And fueled by nitrogen, algae takes over and starves out other plant and animal species. Nitrogen has, been, has emerged recently as a serious threat to coastal ecosystems, particularly to Barnstable on Cape Cod in the Chesapeake Bay area. Tom Miller of the Maryland Cooperative Extension Service says, septic systems often do little to protect groundwater from nitrogen. They were never intended to do that. Um, let's see. He goes on to say, we only designed these systems to get sewage out of the yard so the kids and the dogs didn't play in it and we didn't smell it. We didn't care what happened once it got into the ground and we didn't know any better, unquote. Septic systems fail and these failures can release bacteria and viruses that cause serious health problems. There will, be, will there be room for replacement systems on small lots that already have a house, a driveway, and one failed system? And what if the small lot next door has the same set of circumstances? The state of Maine imposes a minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet where septic is required. The Department of Health Engineering may allow a system on a smaller lot provided that certain conditions are met, but they only determine whether or not that particular lot is suitable for a septic system. They do not consider the cumulative effect of many septic systems on undersized lots packed closely together. Um, therefore, they are issuing septic system permits and they don't look at the possible contamination to groundwater. Now, many Cape residents would be adversely affected by this ordinance change. And for example, bordering the critical wetland around Crescent Beach, um, in Crescent Green there are 33 septic systems on a piece of land that's about 1,000 by 300 feet. Right next door in Crescent View, there's an additional 28 systems on about the same size of land. Right below Crescent, Crescent View, between Crescent View and the wetland is a two acre strawberry field on the other side of Crescent Green, behind Richmond Terrace, is a 4.2 acre strawberry field, and both of those fields are fertilized with nitrogen. There's the septic system for the um, bathhouse at Crescent Beach, and then there's the septic system for, um, for the Inn by the Sea. All of these developed areas flow into the wetlands surrounding Crescent Beach, posing a threat to groundwater safety. It isn't reasonable to allow further contaminants to pose a threat to areas that could already be nitrogen time bombs. Also, under this change, the Great Pond area could end up with five additional septic systems in neighborhoods close to the pond that are already dense with systems. And just on Hunt Point Road alone, there could again be five more systems. Neighborhoods, these are neighborhoods where the comprehensive plan says that problems may exist and uh, there's no reason to take this kind of risk. The 97 ordinance wisely disallows septic on lots smaller than 20,000 square feet in acknowledgement of the dangers of further overpopulating unsewered neighborhoods that were designed long before the vulnerability of groundwater was known. It protects areas of the Cape most vulnerable to pollution from human waste by designating them as not suitable for infill building or growth. The current ordinance appropriately restricts growth in compliance with the comprehensive plan. Nothing has changed in the past four years to warrant the reversal of that ordinance. In fact, we now know more than ever that the risks outlined are real and it's clear that it's clear that it would be a dangerous policy to change the current ordinance. And I urge you to oppose this amendment. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Trisha Nadef. I live on Fessenden Road. Um, near as I can tell, I don't abut anything that is, could be developed on, but I am here to pose the uh, decrease in the size of buildable lots. Um, it struck me as I was listening, though, that it's, it's, it's been a confusing time, I guess, from 97 till now. We've had people who bought thinking they had something buildable, and then we had people who bought thinking that what was next door wasn't buildable. So I, I guess what strikes me as I'm listening is um, what's before you now is the question of what's the best thing to do moving forward for the town and the individuals in the town. Um, my concern is um, I, I can sympathize with the rights of the property owners, both people who bought thinking they had a buildable lot and people who bought thinking the lot next to them wasn't buildable. Um, my concern, though, is that once you make the decision to uh, allow people to move forward and build on these non-conforming lots, um, the decision is made. You, you can't reverse it. You can't dismantle the building. You can't um, restore the character of the neighborhood. Uh, so I guess my request is um, for uh, this process to be as um, thoughtful as possible um, because moving forward too quickly um, in a way that allows people to build on these smaller size lots becomes an irreversible decision um, in terms of the character of these uh, neighborhoods. Um, I've been in this line more times than I ever would have imagined, um, given the bike path on two lights, the Jordan Farm Road issue three times. Um, and now I'm here again, so I guess I'm getting very good at trying to look thoughtful and introspective while I wait my turn when really my stomach is fluttering like crazy. But I just watch you guys how you must look thoughtful and introspective for four hours sitting up here and I just copy different body bits. But what I noticed in both the bike path issue and the Jordan Farm Road issue, which seems to also be coming up now, is um, the concern that people are having about how crowded these neighborhoods are getting. Um, and how it is changing the character of the neighborhoods. And so we have debates about bike paths because it's not safe to ride your bikes on these roads anymore. Um, but creating the bike paths changes the rural nature of the neighborhood. And Jordan Farm Road, um, how unsafe it feels for people in the Broad Cove area. But those of us on the two light side are already feeling like it's getting crazy over there and it's getting built up. And of course, then we have all our tourists who come in. Um, so. What has come from, from these is, 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 for me, this concern that the neighborhoods, particularly the older neighborhoods, are getting crowded. The character is changing. Um, and so I would respectfully request um, that you proceed with great caution. And the question that seems to be before us as a community, although um, a large part of it rests in your hands, is what's the right thing to do now? And if it is better for the town as a whole to keep these open spaces, um, then certainly there is something that needs to happen for these people who own these lots. Um, but I would ask you um, to respectfully consider what is best for us moving forward. Many people have mentioned the comprehensive plan. I would just echo that um, as it's written, it's a strong plan, and I would urge you not to do anything that would compromise it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Faye Lakeman, and I've been a resident of the Two Lights area for 11 years, and I oppose an ordinance change to reduce buildable lot size uh, on non-conforming lots requiring septic. Now, as far as I know, uh, I'm not an abutter uh, to any lots that would be affected by this ordinance change, um, but the basis of my objection uh, stems from two concerns. First of all, uh, while it's obvious how owners of these non-conforming lots of record would benefit from the ordinance change, uh, I don't see uh, how such a change would benefit the town as a whole, uh, and certainly the ordinance change would decrease property values uh, and quality of life for many abutters to these tiny lots. Uh, the basis for my second concern about the proposed ordinance change uh, is it does not, as so many people have mentioned, seem to be consistent with the intent of the uh, 93 Comprehensive Plan, which on page 17 tells us that 
A major function of a comprehensive planning process is to identify sections of a community that are well suited for development and then uh, develop workable strategies for encouraging most new development to occur in these areas. And conversely, uh, new development should be steered away from areas that are environmentally sensitive or otherwise unsuitable for development. Uh, there are five statements uh, that the plan calls the essence of its findings and its recommendations. Uh, I won't go into these because uh, they're on page one and uh, I think many people by now have read them. Uh, but I would like to point out uh, for people who may not be as familiar uh, with the plan as, as uh, certainly you folks are, that each of these five statements uh, appear, to ar appear to argue against a reduction of buildable lot size in the areas of Cape that would be most affected by the proposed change. Um, and uh, someone ha has already mentioned uh, the uh, Cape must either choose to accept the relentless urbanization or uh, of essentially all its open space or elect to adopt an aggressive system of, of controls. Uh, and then the plan says, this plan seeks to affect such an aggressive system of control. So, you know, I don't think there's any question about what the intent was. Uh, I'd just like to, to mention one thing uh, in the plan that I found really interesting uh, that no one has mentioned. It's on page 14. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, I know this plan looks like a pretty thick document. It's, it's really an interesting piece of reading. Uh, it goes pretty quickly once you get into it. I do recommend that, that people read it. Uh, anyway, on page 14, there's info about Cape's population density uh, that supply really surprised me. Uh, we, we are dense, uh, as those of you who've read the plan know. Um, and then another part that was really interesting is uh, reading is the wildlife and invent, uh, environmental uh, information in the natural resources uh, background section, and, and that starts around page 53. Uh, I'd just like to conclude by saying, uh, by reminding people that Mr. Vose is a developer. Um, you know, we're not talking about uh, a naive property o owner here. I, I think it's important to bear that in mind. Uh, I'm not saying that that means he, he doesn't have property rights. I'm just saying that um, we do need to, to be aware of that fact. Um, passage of this ordinance change would seem to uh, not be good for CAPE as a whole and would seem to deny both in spirit and on the face of the earth, as the, as the plan puts it, uh, key recommendations in what appears to be a very, very well-researched document, uh, the, the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Ms. Lakeman? Yes. Could you give us your address for the record? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Beacon Lane. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Chris Carey. I live at Alexander Drive, and um, I'm not in the butter to any of the land under consideration, and I don't have any land that I would consider to be eligible for, uh, for consideration for this, although I own 10 acres of land. I'm not a realtor, and I'm not a developer. Um, my wife and I and <laughs> our two kids live out there, and I just have to say that I enjoy the quality of the neighborhoods I see in Cape Elizabeth, and I think that the board should work hard and cautiously at what they decide, and you ought to decide to keep the uh, zoning regulation the way it is with 20,000 square feet. Thanks very much. Good evening. My name is Alan Bailey. I'm a Cape resident. I live at 52 Kettle Cove Road. <coughs> I have a piece of land on the corner, and there's a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, in question that abuts my property, uh, which when I bought my property over three years ago, I was told that it was buildable, and I found out now that it's not. Um, and my, wife, my wife and I moved in there. Uh, we um, started sort of redoing the house to try to keep the historic value of the house, and uh, we're at a position now where uh, we're not intending to build on our lot next to us. 
We don't know what will happen down in the future. But uh, it, I discovered recently that um, my lot is no longer buildable um, due to some zone change. And uh, I'm kind of confused as to how there was a zone change, zone change without me finding out about it and how, the, how it happened without the town council approving it. Um, it starts to get me to the point where I want to ask myself questions. I, I, I have a nice property. I've been here for 18 years. I've got five kids in the Cape system. Bought a nice house down in Kettle Cove. There's a lot attached to it that I can build on. I pay, think I've paid extra money for my property due to the fact that that lot was buildable. Um, but my wife, sit, my wife and I sit back and we go, will we build on it? We don't know, again. So I ask myself these questions. How could this have happened? Um, who created the new law? prohibiting me to build on my lot? Why was it never discussed by the town council? And why was I never notified about it? And I don't think anybody in here was notified about it either. So uh, in a straight statement, I'd like to have my building rights restored. And I know that the council will, if it gets to that point, will do the right thing. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi, my name is Daryl Molesky. I live at Six Bay Berry Lane. Uh, my neighborhood's been mentioned a couple of times. I am affected by this amendment. I'm opposed to it, uh, more so on the septic issue. Um, when my lot, or house was developed in 1983, it didn't meet the minimum standards back in that time. And I have an easement on a lot right now for a septic system that is deemed, in this amendment it goes through, that would be buildable. So what that does to me is septic systems do fail, and they have failed in my neighborhood, and uh, our groundwater is very high in this neighborhood. It kind of locks me where I can put my septic system. So now we're going to put a house behind me with a septic system. Mine should fail, and my alternative is an easement on the land, so now we have two septic systems possibly on a lot that's uh, minimum size. So again, I... Uh, I voiced my opposition mainly on the groundwater issue. I think we really should look at the groundwater, uh, knowing that the neighborhood is high. And a couple of years ago, um, our water supply in Sebago Lake has been, um, we've had problems up in the Long Lake area. And that's our public water supply because septic systems have failed and leached in phosphorus into the lake. So um, I'm very much opposed. And I hope you consider. Thank you. My name is Dale Brewer. I live on Eastman Road. Um, I believe both sides have valid points, um, but uh, I'm here uh, purely as a professional in the environmental field. I would like to urge all of you to really think about what's going on here with your regulations. Um, these are irreversible effects, and I'm not just talking about these 10,000 square foot lots. I'm, I was kind of irked when I saw your um, comprehensive plan that had targeted developable areas. And, and I just, that doesn't make sense to me at all um, to just designate certain areas in the town to be clustered or completely developed. And it just doesn't, I, I, it doesn't make sense to me to target specific areas in the town to just go ahead, do whatever you want being a realtor, being whatever you are, you know. I just, I just don't understand some of these things that are being brought up, and I just would like to um, uh, have you each really think about the environmental effects. And I'd like to echo the last person who just spoke about there are failing sy systems just about everywhere. Yeah, they're only, they are time dated. They last, you know, some of them, if properly installed, may last 20 years or, or 30 years. It may last 50 years. But when I bought my house, I had to replace our septic system because it was failing. And, and it did, in, you know, in the interim of me purchasing my house and with the state law requiring a new septic system, that whole time there was detrimental effects going into the environment because of a failed system. So I just wanted to make you aware Think it over carefully before you make a decision. Thank you. Uh, 
<coughs> my name is Jeff Armstrong up on 18 Avon Road in Shore Acres. And I want to voice my um, opposition to the amendment and um, a little bit concerned about um, what might possibly happen to some of the um, currently undeveloped lots up in the sh uh, Shore Acres area. And um, I believe that you're using the term non-conforming lot, and maybe that should be you know, kind of italicized and, and uh, point out that 10,000 feet is not very big for uh, an, uh, a non-septic, uh, non-sewer service lot. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Mr. Vos? I'm Rick Fontana, and I just moved to Cape Elizabeth in September. I live on Valley Road. I'm unaware of any effect to my neighborhood of this amendment, but I think just from sort of an outsider view, clearly the developers have obtained benefits from Cape Elizabeth's zoning laws and achieving higher property values. And clearly people who have houses on lots and lots next to them that they thought they could build on have lost something of value. And perhaps something other than allowing someone to build somewhere, many people have said they didn't want to, would be to change the property taxation of that property or some other form of compensation. That's all I have to say. Thanks. <coughs> I'm Bill Jordan, live at 21 Wells Road, Cape Elizabeth. Been there for 75 years or more. So I've seen the Cape change quite a bit. And lately there is a development going in that's going to bother me with only 90 some homes. So think of the progress that's in Cape Elizabeth. But I'm here to speak on my time on the town council, which I don't remember, and I worked on the audience committee many times, <clears throat> of cutting out those 10,000 square foot lots. I think they were still left there, and if a guy was able to use them, they would have the right to use them. We didn't touch as far as the environmental issues, it was just the size of the lot, and uh, I think that the gentleman should be granted permission to use that lot. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leland Murray. I'm at 99 Fowler Road. Um, I am for the, the zone change for the reason that uh, I live on family land that's been passed down. I'm a fourth generation Cape Elizabeth resident here, as I could tell, may go further, but four is all I'll admit to. But uh, the land which I grew up on was the 10,000 square foot house, which my grandfather gave to my father. I live on a piece of property passed down to me from my father. My brother is going to build on a piece of property passed down by my father. <clears throat> and that's the end of the conforming lots. Uh, after that, they go back to 10,000 square feet, which I would like my children to be able to build on when they choose to, or if, if not, I could send them to college by maybe building on one. I'd just like to reserve that right. Thanks. Thanks for letting me speak again. Um, I just wanted to address two things that I heard said over and over again. I just really want to be clear about those two things. The first one is I've heard the comprehensive plan discussed a lot tonight. And I am certain that the comprehensive plan was designed to help guide the growth of our town through the years and, and is continually used as a reference for that. I don't believe the comprehensive plan is intended to be used when we're talking about restoring rights from people that were taken away improperly. 
Um, it has nothing to, one has nothing to do with the other in that regard. These lots actually existed long before our town even had a comprehensive plan. So that's the first point. And the second thing I'd like to mention is that um, I believe his name was Mr. Gardner, I don't recall exactly, but he, he made a very eloquent statement about the, the possibility that the apprentices, I'm sorry, the abutters next to me uh, who spoke um, could really be injured by the restoration of my building rights. And I would just like to be really clear with, with you and with them that that's never been my intention is to see them injured. Um, in fact, uh, when I understood that they had the house under contract from Alan Giroux, the former owner, uh, it was about the time that I was discovering that I had this problem with my lot, with the town, and I was discussing it with the town. I made certain that I called the seller of the property to ask him to be sure that they were aware that I had a building lot in front and that I intended to build on it. And he said, yes, I've told them. I also spoke with his wife, and she said, yes, I've told them. Um, and then after that, I actually had an attorney call the apprentices on my behalf prior to them purchasing the house. They had it under contract only. And I have a letter from that attorney with me this evening that just basically re reiterates that Mrs. Prentice spoke with him and said, I'm aware of the, the, the situation with Paul Vos's building rights and I intend to oppose him um, to get them restored. So they had notice that there was a building lot in front of them and that I intended to get my rights restored. And I do not mean to be making any personal attacks. That's not my nature and not my intent. But I do want you to know that because I think it's important to be aware that this was not a blindsided deal for them. And for me, it was, actually. I had no idea my rights were taken. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Erin Grady Gallant. I live at 52 Columbus Road, and I am a realtor, but I wanted to just ask a question, I guess, of Maureen, because it was brought up before about the notification to people, because as a broker, when I sell property, I do my research, and I let them know, yes, you may have a buildable lot that you could lose of you, or you, there are certain rules and regulations that you must follow. And, my question is, is it a new policy for the town to notify people if they're losing their building rights, or is that something that's been there all along and just wasn't done in this case? Sure. The town has no policy to notify individual building owners, individual lot owners, of the status of their property for each and individual zoning amendment. We have policies regarding map amendments and text amendments. Uh, the most recent amendment we've processed has been uh, the tower overlay district amendments. If I use that as an example, we created two tower overlay districts. All the people within the geographic area of the tower overlay district and all the people who were abutters of that district received a first class mailed notice with a map telling them that there would be a change. There were other changes that went along with that text, that, with that set of amendments. For example, there was uh, a regulation that limited the height of amateur radio towers, ham radio towers, to 50 feet in a neighborhood. Uh, we did not mail a notice to everyone who may want to erect a tower at some point in the future. We didn't have a way to find out who the ham radio operators were. Those were text amendments, and so we use legal ads in the paper. Uh, we put articles in the Cape Courier describing those amendments. We use the website to post the amendments. And um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is when you amend the zoning ordinance, before it can be amended, that has to be sent to the planning board. And as this evening, the planning board has to hold a public hearing and a set of notices goes out for that meeting. Uh, then it goes back to the council. The council also has, also has to hold a public hearing and they need to send notices again. So for any time that a mailed notice goes out, you should be getting one at least twice. But for text amendments, you would not normally get a notice because we don't do an analysis of individual lot impacts. There are 4,300 lots in the town of Cape Elizabeth, and quite frankly, it's beyond our capabilities to do each individual lot on text amendments. But wouldn't, if you, if you were losing your building rights on a lot that you 
new as being buildable, that wouldn't warrant getting an individual letter that that was no longer going to happen? We wouldn't do an analysis to see who was, quote, losing their building rights. So they weren't, they did not receive letters when they lost the The only building. people that receive first class mailed letters are people who are within areas where there was a geographical change to the zoning map. So in 1997, there were proposed zone changes for scenic areas. All of those people received map and letters. There was a change from resident zone A to resident zone B for several property owners. All of those property owners, all the abutters, received a first class mailed notice. Um, all the people who see were in the Great Pond Overlay District. Again, it's a specific geographical mapped area would have received a first class mailed notice. But that was a 200 page document. And I'm sure there are many property owners that were affected by many of the provisions in that zoning ordinance. And we did not analyze every lot in the town to see how they were affected by every provision in the zoning ordinance. Okay, thank you. Can I, can, can I make a comment first? I would prefer that this discussion uh, remain impartial as possible, and I don't want it to deteriorate into a he said, she said type of discussion tonight, an argument between various parties that are affected here. Well, I just have two things I'd like to say. One, I don't think goes too far in the he said, she said. But it, while it's true that Mr. Vos notified us that he wanted to build on his lot, it's also true that we had a letter from the town council saying it wasn't buildable and it seemed reasonable that we could count on that as having some meaning. The other thing, since so much has been made about certain people feeling that their rights were taken away, I would just have to say again that, I, for instance, I read a letter by my neighbor, Mr. Ott, who has a 8,400 square foot lot in the same area who believes he has rights to build on it. And there have to be many, many lots like that in this town. You could find many, many people who would say, I didn't know I couldn't build on it. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, you yourselves have decided that even 61 more in sewer areas would not be a good idea. So at some point, for the good of the town, there has to be some change in what's allowed. And I think that's what's happening. Thank you very much. If for your benefit, I will have to say that we have wrestled with that many, many nights and have spent a lot of time talking about that subject. Yeah, I'm daily guy. It's okay to get up to everybody else the second time. Um, I'm still confused why my rights were taken away without being notified. I mean, you talk about towers and all this other stuff. Did you take people's rights to build away with that? Or, or any other things that you've mentioned. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me why someone can choose who to notify and who not to notify about his own change or building rights being taken away, um, especially when they're notified for other things about, uh, that seem to be more in, 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 in hand of keeping the town the way it is. Um, I'd like some explanation about that. I don't know if this is the right time to get it, but I'd like to know why we weren't notified about this change. I mean, we're notified tonight. Why are we here? I mean, why didn't you just do something else? As an answer to your question, I think that that has been pr presented two times by Ms. O'Mara, and that question has been asked earlier this evening. How, what the typical method is of notification. <laughs> And the procedure well, is that the there town any comment that can be made on, on this particular situation instead of citing other instances? Um, my position is that the changes to the zoning ordinance that created this issue happened in 1997. And in 1997, the focus of the whole effort was to rewrite the entire zoning ordinance. And it was the purpose of the rewrite was to make the ordinance more user-friendly, um, more easy to read, more consistent. We had an ordinance prior to 97 that had been amended many times. Parts of the ordinance dated back to the 70s. Um, if, you, if I brought it to you today, you could flip to a certain section and you wouldn't be able to find out where your setbacks were. 
It was a great document for job security for those who worked here, <laughs> but it was really hard for anyone else to use, and there were a lot of holes in it. So the original purpose of rewriting the zoning ordinance wasn't to make a lot of policy changes. Uh, subsequently, there was an agreement that a lot of the recommendations of the comprehensive plan should be incorporated into the zoning ordinance, and so we had a list of policy changes which we presented at the same time. Uh, but the non-conforming provisions were never supposed to have major policy changes in them. All we were trying to do was take two different sections of the ordinance which never fit together and reformat them so they made sense. And the problem was that we couldn't figure out what they said at that time. I was in a meeting with the code enforcement officer at that time who has the full authority to interpret the ordinance. And we said, this is what we're going to write, is this what you do now? And three different meetings occurred and each time we got a different answer. So there was a real struggle and I would be the first one to say that the non-conforming provisions had a ton of problems with them. In 1997, I stood in front of the town council and I said, here's the new non-conforming provisions. And I, I don't think there are any policy changes in here. We never intended to have any policy changes, but I frankly can't tell you whether there are or there aren't, because I don't know what it said before. Uh, so there, I, don't, I don't remember a specific goal to take people who could build before 1997 and not allow them to build. That doesn't mean that wasn't an intent, but I can tell you that the, the new ordinance did get full review, including this provision. And further, your question about why weren't you notified. Um, again, when we have a text change to an ordinance, um, it could affect 4,500 property owners in town. It could affect only 10. We'd have to go through each single property. And quite frankly, our, that's just not our practice. We don't have the staff to do that. So what we do is rely on legal notice. And in the case of the non-conforming provisions in 1997, we did publish articles in the Courier that said these provisions are changing. So if someone had a non-conforming lot, the hope would be that you would call and find out. Um, but again, you need to get an answer you can rely on. And I'm not sure that answers were provided that people could rely on. I can tell you that the current code officer um, has been interpreting the 1997 ordinance uh, ever since it was adopted, and I haven't found him to be inconsistent in that. But uh, certainly it isn't the policy of the town to surprise people, but you will not always get a mailed notice to your town. Sometimes you really do need to look at the paper and look at the courier. We, we make every effort. Um, it is our goal to make sure people are notified and they're not surprised. This is certainly <coughs> not the best way to do business. Well, you know, I'm, uh, as I said earlier, w my family is trying to preserve the area where we are. We don't have intentions to build right now, but as other gentlemen have pointed out here, that their fathers have left their land to their kids and what they do with it is their choice. And uh, if for something as important as this, I, I would have thought that everybody sitting up here would have liked to have known or been notified whether or not they had a lot that was going to be stripped of its building rights. And, and I respect everything that you guys do, uh, but that's my only position. Just I, I still don't understand it. I, I would important. caution, and I'll take, I'll take this opportunity, I would caution anyone who owns property in any town, especially a lot that is called nonconforming, that means a lot that doesn't meet the current requirements, to be very, very aware of any zoning changes that occur, because any single one of those zoning changes could affect the, the, the buildability of your property. And it, it is a serious issue, and I have people who come in all the time and I say, you need to, you need to keep, keep track of these things. Um, in this town, the best way to do that is to read the Cape Courier, because we make a, a strong effort to get our articles in there. Um, but it, it is, uh, as a property owner, it's something you do have to keep track of. The council chooses to amend the ordinance as they see fit. Well, I suppose that's correct, but it's, it's difficult to, to find out after the fact. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if I discuss new information only, may I have another minute? Yes. The uh, town planner is the staff who supports the planning board. The town manager that was here earlier is the staff that supports the town council. The town council notification, whenever there were any changes, is public forum, public hearing, public notice, letter to the editor, I mean, excuse me, letter to the Cape Courier, article to the Cape Courier. Full disclosure. So for purposes of this discussion and your answer to Mr. Bailey, 
may be correct that he didn't have to receive a notice but as a member of the one nine hundred ninety seven council who has been suggested as having voted intentionally to have calls cause this unintended consequence to sixteen vacant lots and a total of about thirty lots absolutely did not happen with the knowledge of those people who were voting at that time you have letters in your packets you had mr jordan appear tonight you have joe groff rosemary reed phyllis cargoshaw and others who state we did not vote to take away people's rights and had we done that it would not have happened in silence and i ask you to please consider that for those thirty two people thank you Good evening, I'm Joe Graff. I live at 49 Wood Road and I was chairman of the town council. I am, have been very distressed by this issue because Zork was quite a process and I'm very proud of the whole Zork process and my part in the council's part in it. This technical amendment was presented to the council as a technical amendment and that was not going to affect people's substantive rights. It was simply an amendment that we were, along with other things, it was going to make it more user-friendly. We were not, uh, we were going to tie up inconsistencies. This was not a policy issue that the town council voted on. And that's why he didn't get notice. Nobody knew that it would be interpreted this way. This is like a stealth bomber. And I'm not taking a position on what's right for the town or wrong for the town or any of your property rights. I haven't been back in this room since I stopped being chairman of the town council because I'm a big believer that you do your best for three years, you come in with the vision, and then when you're done, you rely on the people that come after you to make decisions. And I don't, I've never attempted to influence any decision after I've stop being chairman of the town council. But this is wrong in the sense to present it that the town council intentionally did something, uh, was following uh, the comprehensive plan. That's not what happened. Now you can make whatever decision you want on the merits, but don't make a decision based upon the intent of the town council at the time because that's just not True. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? And I think it's been said earlier tonight too that maybe we should try to make a decision on the merits and not on what's a debatable intent apparently since I've heard both people said they intended it and people that didn't intend it. And that really doesn't have a lot to do with going forward, in my opinion. Thank you. Any other interest in speaking? I will close the hearing at this time. Board members, I guess we have heard, uh, we've heard from the floor. We spent many hours discussing this issue, and I will open it up again now for further discussion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, just uh, like to open uh, with uh, just a preliminary statement that um, to try to maybe uh, give a little bit of understanding to it. I don't have uh, each exact word-for-word uh, -word change that happened in the ordinance uh, when it was rewritten over the course of 1996 and, and adopted uh, at that time. Uh, but just, just to let people know uh, sort of how this all came to be. It, it sort of seems in, in particular now from listening to people that there's a sense of bewilderment. You know, how, how could this happen? Uh, 
you know, in, in theory, you know, these things are all supposed to be taken into account and done with deliberation. Uh, so I, I think that just to maybe uh, give, to, to relate to other board members, the sense of what that uh, rewrite, rewrite was about was that there were, there, were, there were many things in different sections of the ordinance which existed prior to that time in various different sections, in different chapters, and in, and in different areas of, of, a, of a very sort of chock-a-block document that related to how non-conforming lots were dealt with. And it appears uh, that uh, there were a lot of issues when the ordinance was rewritten that were tackled as policy issues uh, in order to change how the town treated the issues, and, and this one was not one of them. Uh, this, was, this was one topic within the ordinance uh, that was more of a approached as a housekeeping sort of uh, operation uh, because it did nobody benefit uh, if they wanted to come into town hall and find out uh, what they could do or wh how land use laws related to them to, to, uh, uh, to have to wade through uh, you know, five different chapters of, of the ordinance or, or expect the town staff to be able to, to keep up on where these things all were. So the, the intent at the time was one of housekeeping and uh, trying to make an ordinance that was usable uh, by townspeople and town staff. And uh, everybody involved in these committees uh, doesn't, uh, how should I say this, the Somewhere along the line, there is a phrase that was left out of one of those chapters and verses somewhere, which uh, the old ordinance, uh, by its practice, allowed these lots down to 10,000 square feet with uh, approval of the minimum lot size waiver uh, from the state of Maine. Uh, but even that was something that was just in a phrase, in a sentence, maybe not even in the section of the ordinance or no right where one would have expected to have found it. And in the, in, in the translation and rewrite and the attempt to make the ordinance uh, uh, sort of uh, more compartmentalized and relating to what one would look, look to there for information, one, one little phrase somehow or other ended up not in the picture anymore. Uh, and, and that was only discovered later when somebody sat down to look for a build, to issue a building permit and went through it word by word and said, well, where did this go? It's not here anymore. And, and uh, so it's, a, it's an act of, of uh, omission, uh, you know, of, 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 a, of a committee of town people working uh, two or three nights a month for a year uh, around a table trying to sort through a several hundred page document and, and make it better. Uh, so that's why we're here, and, and it's, uh, it's something that we now have to decide what's best for us. So I just thought that that might be, at least having been through it, uh, that seems to have been what happened, and now we move on. So Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Charles. As a, as a recent arrival on the planning board, I've only participated in this discussion officially for the last few months, but I've been following it for some time. And I certainly would like to commend and thank those members of the planning board who've been along for the ride for the past year as this thorny issue has been discussed. I think you folks have done a great job trying to sort it out. And Maureen as well with the analysis and the, the backup work. This is a really tough issue. I've given this a lot of thought. I've uh, tried to listen carefully to what was said tonight, and I've read all of the letters and submissions that have come into the board. There's some very good reasons to change the current ordinance. Uh, some people truly believe that their property rights were taken away from them in 1997 without warning. There are questions of equity and fairness. Uh, there may have been some confusion when the ordinance was enacted with an unintended consequence. And uh, some people have been paying taxes on lots assessed at a buildable value when maybe they really aren't. But there are also a lot of reasons not to change the current ordinance. Uh, one thing that, that bothers me personally is it would be 
in my view, inconsistent and bad policy to have minimum lot sizes for sewered and unsewered lots be the same. That's, that's inconsistent with the, the way CAPE has written its ordinances and that's inconsistent with all the towns around us as I understand it. There was some degree of advance notice provided when the zoning ordinance was rewritten, not specifically to those landowners affected, but as Maureen pointed out, there were notices in the Cape Courier, there were notices in the paper. Uh, there was discussion about the ordinance rewrite. Another issue that, that uh, weighs on me is that we can't turn back the clock and but land values are rising and Cape Elizabeth is, is a desirable destination. And I think it's inevitable that every buildable lot will be built upon at some point in the not too distant future. There's too much money involved for that not to happen. So I think we need to consider that. And that's a quality of life issue that all of us need to consider. And I think there's a possibility that uh, restoring the ordinance to its previous form may benefit a few property owners, but it may indeed negatively impact many more who either abut that property or who are residents of the town. Having, having given this a lot of thought myself, I think the pros and cons are compelling. There's no single answer that's going to make everybody happy. And it's really more than an intellectual issue, it's a gut issue. Speaking for myself, having carefully weighed the facts in this issue and, and contemplated the impact of both changing and not changing, I cannot support the change. And uh, much as I wish we could go back in time and redo what happened in 97, we can't. I will therefore vote against the proposed ordinance change. I would make one additional comment though. The ordinance change as proposed uh, has really three elements. One is the change to the minimum lot size, which I, which I oppose. Uh, there's another, there are two other changes that clarify the distinction between non-conforming lots in subdivisions and those not in subdivisions and the addition of illustrations to clarify how the ordinance is to be interpreted. Those latter two, I think, are important and valuable changes and I would support those particular changes to the ordinance. Thank you. Any further discussion? Well, Mr. Chairman, I guess I, if we are going to vote on this issue, I would like to at least explain the reason why I'm voting, why I'm voting. Um, since this issue has come up, we've struggled with it for a long time. Uh, I have expressed the view that I didn't think a change to the ordinance was appropriate. Um, I think we should remind everyone how this issue first came to us. And this issue first came to us from the town council with a proposed amendment that basically would have affected only Mr. Vose's lot. Uh, and I, I commend this planning board for making this issue a townwide issue to look at uh, how this ordinance should or should not affect everyone rather than just one property owner. And as I've said to Mr. Vose before and other abutters before, I, I can't look at this in terms of what's better for one property owner versus another property owner. I can't even look at this in terms of what the town council may have meant to do or not may have meant to do. I'm trying to look at this and I hope the planning board's looking at this in terms of is this ordinance appropriate and the right thing to do for the town of Cape Elizabeth going forward. Um, there, uh, even in the 1997 ordinance, there has been a distinction between the minimum uh, lot size for lots that uh, are on sewer and the minimum lot size for lots uh, that have septic systems. Um, there's no question that uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, every town in this area, every uh, town that we've looked at makes that distinction. Uh, I don't think that uh, it was, uh, if we were coming here today with a clean slate and all things being equal, I don't think this planning board would be saying that for non-conforming lots, the minimum lot size should be the same for sewered lots and non-sewered lots. Uh, I just don't think we'd even be having that discussion. Um, given the uh, proposed ordinance as it is, frankly, I think it's clearer and gives people a better idea of what to expect uh, in eliminating the uh, 
state statute waiver because it this way it tells people that you cannot build on a non conforming lot under twenty thousand square feet if you have a septic so you know that right away rather than having to determine whether you can or can't get the uh, the waiver from the state that puts a butters on an equal footing with someone uh, who who has a non conforming lot and again this is going forward so I think the ordinance is actually clearer without that uh, waiver in it which which was certainly omitted and just so everyone understands the simple reason this is a, a very complicated issue but to me the simple reason that prevents a lot, a non-conforming lot of under 20,000 square feet to be built upon was the emission of the exception created by the state uh, minimum lot size statute which was taken out of the ordinance. That's, that's really what created this issue. Whereas before, you could, if you sought that uh, exception under the state, you could build in under 20,000 square feet. That was taken away. And I guess the way I'm looking at the issue is going forward, is that the better way to have this ordinance with that exception in, or, or is it better to have it with the exception not in? And as I said, I think it's clear to everyone going forward to see a very straightforward uh, criteria for when you can and when you can't build. Um, it's unfortunate that the way this has proceeded has caused some property owners to think their rights were taken away and if changed would cause other property owners to think their rights were taken away. But we have no control over that part of the process. We can only comment on what ordinance should the town use uh, going forward. And, and I feel that the ordinance as written uh, is clear, gives everyone an equal opportunity to figure out what can and can't be done and uh, it, it shouldn't be changed. There's no community that has the same lot size requirements for, for building on a non-conforming lot, and I don't think we should be the first. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would also like to express my reasons for why I am uh, in opposition to the proposed change to the minimum lot size requirement. Uh, I don't think any of us on this planning board uh, would suggest that the town council intended to take away people's property rights when they enacted the changes that they did back in 1997. Uh, I'm also very sympathetic, frankly, to the uh, situation that Mr. Votes finds them in. I'm, I'm frankly sympathetic to the situation that the abutters are finding themselves in as well. They're, they're good and compelling arguments for both sides. What I am looking at is what is best for the town of Cape Elizabeth going forward, and I believe what is best for the town of Cape Elizabeth is to maintain the minimum lot size uh, for non-conforming lots of 20,000 for non-sewered areas. Uh, I, I think we all have a responsibility to the town and its future, and I would hate in 10 or 15 or 20 years for us all to be looking back, seeing neighborhoods become more crowded, the loss of these open spaces, and think, geez, we had an opportunity to, pre to prevent that, and we didn't take that opportunity. And uh, uh, one of the uh, speakers here tonight, a resident of Fessenden Road, was very eloquent uh, in her view that what we really need to think about is what is best for the town going forward and I believe what is best going forward is to maintain the uh, zoning ordinance as is with respect to minimum lot sizes. Thank you. I guess I'll add my voice to this choir and um, <coughs> indicate um, that I will also vote against it. It's actually a change from my previous thinking on the subject and like everybody on the board I have struggled with this mightily to the detriment of my family and um, my sleep and other things. I have spent too much time during this process trying to second guess what happened in 1996 and 1997 and I found it impossible to make those calls. I wasn't a part of the process. I don't know what decisions were made or specifically not made. Um, all I can do myself is take the 1997 ordinance as written, interpret it. I agree that it's being interpreted correctly the way it's written without the past history. Um, I agree that 1999 was a technical amendment only and didn't change anything. Um, I think that 20,000 square feet is a reasonable lot size for a non-sewered lot. Um, and for those reasons, um, I guess I'm pretty much echoing in other words what the other people that have spoken against have said, but I will be voting against. 
Any further discussion? Mr. Chair, um, I guess there, there have been some comments tonight um, about the, the relevance of the town's comprehensive plan to uh, ordinance craft uh, or our mission and duties uh, as a, a planning board in general. And I think the, uh, the effort that went into uh, crafting uh, the current proposal that's in front of us uh, was not misguided. Uh, there are, there are in, indeed, I think it addresses uh, issues that were at the, at the heart of the uh, zoning ordinance rewrite and the comprehensive plan when it was enacted, that if, uh, if one takes uh, a long view, and long views uh, were done at the time of the zoning ordinance rewrite, uh, unless a wall is built at the South Portland line, you know, in, in 50 years there will be no farmland left in Cape Elizabeth. There, there will be no sense of, quote, rural character, unquote, that people find desirable about this community. Uh, and uh, in my view, uh, you know, if there are 30 families who want to be able to live in neighborhoods that are already 10,000 square foot lots and uh, that keeps uh, over 100 acres near Pheasanton Road from turning into uh, a manicured subdivision, uh, I think that's to the benefit of this town. Uh, I, I agree that there are problems with people coming in and building blockbusters on undersized lots. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, folks who have the budgets to do so uh, create those problems. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me that that's, uh, that's really uh, sort of part of the, the, uh, the ordinance uh, task at hand. Uh, and that what we have uh, crafted so far uh, replaces uh, what once upon a time uh, was a murky, murky process uh, with something that is, that is clear in this document also. Uh, so I guess it, uh, that uh, there's sort of a, uh, there's sort of a, a, a sprawl uh, debate aspect to the, to the ordinance that we've uh, crafted and proposed here. And it's obviously something where the, uh, the, the challenge of, of fighting sprawl is not uh, is, is not one where you can easily say it will happen someplace else because by its nature that's how sprawl is created. It's uh, how do we fit together and and live together. Uh, so I'm I'm still I still feel that what we've created here is is a valuable tool and uh, would serve the town well in the future. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Mr. Chairman. I would like to move this along to the town council with a recommendation for their consideration, not necessarily for their approval. But I'd like to think of myself as a political realist. Uh, the town council will propose, I believe, an ordinance change, if, even if we do absolutely nothing this evening. Uh, town council is the proper board to take under consideration. Uh, the political standing of townspeople, to have the strength to vote against the majority when they, their conscience tells them to, or to ride with the majority when their conscience tells them to do that also. But uh, I don't think it's absolutely necessary for the planning board to move this forward with a recommendation for approval. I'd like to move it forward to the town council with a recommendation for their consideration. I anticipate changes to be made by the town council. I'm very curious as to what those changes would be. Uh, at the point in time when this matter comes back before the planning board for final approval, I will make my decision at that time whether or not I'll vote in favor or against it. Uh, I have not made up my mind at this time, but I do wish to move this matter to the town council. Thank you, Mr. Carter. I guess at this point, uh, 
I can say that uh, we have a motion in front of us here that we have discussed and we spent a lot of time on it. And I agree with Mr. Carter in that we need to move this ahead. Uh, if that's the wish of anybody on the board, I would entertain a motion at this time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carter. I'd like to make the following motion. Motion for the board to consider, be it ordered, that based on the analysis conducted and the facts presented to the planning board, the planning board recommends the attached nonconforming lot zoning amendments to the town council for their consideration. There is a motion been made. Is there a second? I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure I understand the motion. Uh, what what proposed amendment is he planning is, is is being sought to be presented to the town council? As I as I understand it here. I mean, with the reduction in the lot size or without the re reduction? As it stands. It is, it is a reduction in lot size. You have the option as a member to discuss that motion, make amendments to it, has to have amendments to it, or vote against it. Does it not need to be seconded first? It would have to be seconded. Page 211. Thank you, Maureen. I fast just found it. Do I have a second to this motion? Perhaps to, to um, uh, give a little uh, clarification to what we are uh, in, in terms of uh, Mr. Cotter's suggestion, he says uh, the actual ordinance requirement says that prior to consideration of any proposed amendment or change by the town council, it shall be submitted to the planning board for its recommendations. Planning board shall hold a public hearing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> And it merely says that the town council shall not consider any amendment or change until it has received the planning board's recommendation or not less than 60 days has elapsed since the council referred the item to the planning board. Well, we kind of missed that. Uh, it does not say we have to say approve or disapprove in our, in our recommendation. Uh, uh, so with that uh, bit of knowledge, I would second Mr. Cutter's Motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Do I hear any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I believe the recommendation was that we, we send this on to town council for their consideration. Uh, however, the motion as presented is, is recommending that the town council adopt it, and therefore I will maintain my position in opposition. I would point out to the members, though, that I'm prepared to offer an alternative motion after we voted on this one. But didn't Mr. Carter say when he read the motion, he left out the word adopted and said for its consideration? So that's the motion on the table right now. I believe the accompanying letter that goes with the motion uh, includes words that say that it is the recommendation of the planning board that the, right. the amendment to the ordinance be adopted as written, which includes the reduction in minimum lot size for nonconforming lots. Based on the motion, that letter would have to be changed. 
Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess I, I don't think it would be fair to the town council or to all the people that came here to try to to what I would say is duck the issue by saying let's give it to the town council and for their consideration. We're, we're charged with making a recommendation one way or the other and as I understand it, the ordinance we send to the town council, we are sending with our recommendation that that, that be considered. Um, they asked, we've looked at this issue for, I don't know, Maureen, has it been a year? It seems like 10 years, but it, we, we've looked in, at In May, it. it'll be a year. In May, it'll be a year. And, and I, for one, would feel uncomfortable after all that time in telling the town council, we, we still don't know, or we'll leave it up to you. Um, uh, we're here to make a recommendation. Uh, I, I've given my view. If I were to enunciate my recommendation, it would be that the ordinance not be changed. Uh, but I don't think that we should give back to the town council the issue with no recommendation or view one way or the other. Um, so I, I would vote against the motion uh, for that reason alone. Any further discussion? Hearing no discussion, I will present to the board a request to vote on the motion that was presented by Mr. Potter. All those in favor, show by raising their right hand. All those opposed? The motion has not passed. I therefore would open it up for further discussion. If there is a concern with this, if somebody cares to amend or make another motion, I would entertain it at this time. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to suggest we consider rewording the draft letter to the town council such that it is the planning board's recommendation uh, that lots between 10 and 20,000 square feet in size located in unsuited areas uh, not be made buildable and that the minimum lot size for those lots be maintained at 20,000 square feet as currently written in the ordinance. Uh, I would, however, leave in the language that clarifies the interpretation of the ordinance by the addition of drawings and the uh, clarification of the distinction between lots that are, are and are not in subdivisions. And I would uh, ask that the town planner make sure there are not other references to the minimum lot size contain this document that I've overlooked so that our, our policy going forward is consistent. What I would suggest is that we take the chart that is that has the minimum lot sizes and where it says recommended 10,000 square feet for lots on septic systems, you would take that and change it so that it says 20,000 square feet and then I will go through the draft report and make sure that what's said in the report is consistent with that recommendation. And that way the rest of the amendments would basically go forward as they are written. That's exactly what I meant, thank you. <laughs> At this point then, uh, if you would re reword a motion, if, you, if that's your wish. Mr. Chairman, I propose the following motion be it ordered that based on the analysis conducted and the facts presented, the planning board recommends the attached amended non-conforming lots of zoning amendment to the town council for adoption. Just to clarify your amendment to, to it would indicate that the minimum lot size non sewage would be 20,000 square feet. And septic. Yes, sir. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, then I present it to vote. All those in favor of the motion that's been made, please show by raising your right hand. All those opposed, my right hand. 
The motion has passed. Is there any other business in front of the board this evening? Hearing no comments, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion we adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. So moved.